do my I guess let me let me ask you guys do you so you have uh, synergy in Canada we do yes we do because I was looking on the J&J &J site and I didn't see that it said that it was available in Canada but. yes we, and you you have IHANS is just approved in the US I understand right true yep but no synergy Okay, yeah, we've had synergy here. So that's, uh, we've had it for about, just about nine months or so. So. Wow. We're yeah. so backward here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got some things we don't. We just, we just got Active Century and oh. Hybrid Tip available here now. I see people are joining us already. Great. We've got some early, join, early folks who've joined, joined us. So. Yeah. We had a lot of people right at 940. I'm wow. Okay. The meeting, it was people already there. So it's fantastic. I'm impressed. On Saturday morning. Kosovo or Argentina, Venezuela, Brazil. Where else this is gone. This is TCC International, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> look really at it. It is. Wow. I don't know if it's, it's a Toronto Cataract. Iran. Anymore. Look at that. Iran, I should say. Sorry. Oh my Singapore. gosh. Wow. Singapore. Algeria. This is really like amazing to see such a global village, which we are. We are. COVID's it. taught us that if they haven't seen already. UK. Let's see. We should count the number of countries yeah yeah it'll be a lot um and i'm gonna you sent me the um the final cases right so i have yes, that I did, too. yeah yeah tunisia right. wow Chile. amazing Chile. algeria Sh singapore Sh Sharif, the goal is that all the countries that are here you have to visit them now okay Sharif. <laughs> <laughs> oh what what an awful task <laughs> yes can I have that? <laughs> can well, if, if you insist, Ike, I'll get on my way right after the. <laughs> as long as I can pack your bags and carry them, I'll, I'm fine. I can, I can carry pretty well. <laughs> look at look at how many countries though. Oh, New Hampshire, that's a country. There hey, you uh, go. That's where I grew up, New Hampshire. Oh, very cool. Dubai, oh, Sweden, surprisingly, Panama, <laughs> Indonesia. Must be late Fantastic. in Indonesia. Thing. It's about probably yeah, just in the afternoon, late afternoon. Yeah. Late afternoon. Nine p.m. The there. The only, only I feel I do feel bad for the West Coast folks. I know Nicole. It's early in the morning. You think she? I'm just gonna send her a text. Hopefully, <laughs> nine fifty-eight. <laughs> The Kathy is you know we're we're both Amadeep and I have a have sort of a didactic uh, case. Um, set and uh, and then we'll go through cases and that's kind of where we'd love to get your your feedback and well and also also with our presentations and and your um you know you can as you have before you can cut me up and criticize me no problem take it easy i'll, I'll do I'm the deep. best i can <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna be super nice so be gentle on him oh i i could tell already he was like oh you're the nice guy i got a good cop bad cop we got it <laughs> Very true. And I should, I should have mentioned you, I think, you know, Dr. Elder Frau, he's our, he's our chair. Yeah, we, we met just met. Now. Yes. yes. Uh, very nice. Thank you for joining. Yeah, very happy to meet you. And I think we have Nicole coming on. I see her. The drum roll. Thank there you. she is. Hi, Nicole. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm sorry. It's a little early for you. Good. I mean, on a Saturday, at least. Get all cute the sun, but, the sun but, is yeah. up. I think I think you're competing with Dr. Elder Frawi for the best hair. It's true. It's true. <laughs> I'm competing with you, Ike. <laughs> oh come right. on. No competition. Right. No competition. You I, I'm like uh, I woke up, I was like, where am I? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't know if you've met uh you've met uh Shreef Elder Frawi. He's our chair at University of Toronto. Hi Nicole, Hi. welcome. Yeah. He's Thanks. gonna make sure I uh, I behave. So you will I, I I will have to be. You'll see I'll be. I, you're really behaving well today. You'll know why because Dr. Alderfrau <laughs> is watching me. I, I've never been successful at keeping uh, Ike behaving, but no we'll one try has. Uh, and Amadeep Rai, who's uh, who's here, is, uh, is our associate program director at the university, uh, and he's uh, a, a real rising star in our program and internationally. And he's he's part of the program here and helped organize things. So. Great to see him here too. And you know Kathy, of course. How are you? <laughs> nice to meet you, Nicole. Good. It's so nice good to see you. See Thanks you. for all the hard work. Yeah. Everything together. Well, it's my pleasure. And we are going to be ready very soon. It uh, looks like we uh, 
have almost 300 people logged in, which is great. We did uh, do a little bit of hyping up for the, for the meeting. It was kind of fun. That was great. Yeah. So, and we have an international group here. I mean, and people are continuing to write in, but please write in where you're, where you're calling in from or where you're logging in from. It's always nice to, uh, to kind of feel together during these difficult times. Here, here in Canada, we are going through a bit of a rough patch with the third wave. And our, and our vaccination program is, is hopefully starting to pick up, but uh, we've, uh, we're now on, on more of a severe lockdown. In fact, many of us at our hospitals are gonna be basically shutting down most elective surgery. So it is a bit of a challenge. We're kind of back to, feels like back to square one in some ways, although we're optimistic. Um, I know in the US things are, are a little bit variable, but I, I think you guys have gotten a bit back, I understand, to your surgery volumes, I, I think. Right, is that true, Kathy and, and Nicole? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely true in our center. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean, Kathy, you're in Florida. I don't think, I think COVID was, no, a, I think COVID down. didn't go to Florida, right? We don't actually believe in COVID down <laughs> there. Believe in COVID. That's right. That's no, right. Yes. it's something happening somewhere else, but it's not <laughs> happening here, apparently. Uh, California is doing a really good job with the vaccination. So things are opening up, but everyone's still being cautious. Yeah. That's good to hear. Things are, things are, uh, you gotta still be cautious here. Saskatchewan, good. Oh no, okay. Right. <laughs> Vancouver. So we, we should we should get started here. Um, let me just uh, get my computer resolution good. I want to I want to thank uh, everybody for joining us here. It's uh, a nice Saturday morning here in in uh, in Toronto, and I hope it's great where you you all are. And everybody, again, please uh, stay safe and be well. But we're, uh, we're super excited to have everybody here for our, uh, our cataract course. This is, uh, I've, I've lost count now, Dr. Alderfrau. I don't know, I think it's 13 years, I think. I wanna say, I, I think it's about, actually more than that. It's probably about uh, 18, 19 years now. It's been, <laughs> been a long time since we've been doing this. It's, and we've had them in person every year. It's been a nice one day program we do in Toronto, usually in February and March. Um, and we invite all of you. This is, this, is a, this is the first time we've done it virtually. And, um, and it's great to see such a international uh, attendance. And we do want to invite you all next year uh, to Toronto. Uh, I know you've heard rumors that Toronto may be a little bit cold in, in the winter, but you know, with climate change, uh, things are changing. Um, and it is actually uh, quite nice uh, often on a few days in February and March. So uh, come up and visit, do some skiing, outdoor activities, skating. Uh, hopefully we'll have you here uh, next year. Um, this is an abbreviated program um, this year, and uh, we will get into the program shortly. But I did want to start off, uh, as we do every year, with uh, a few opening remarks from our chair, uh, Dr. Elder Frawi, who has been uh, always a strong supporter uh, of uh, the program of the university uh, and of the course as well. Uh, before uh, his uh, job here, he was uh, chair at uh, Kingston, and we often had him here in our program, and uh, we now uh, are fortunate to have him here in Toronto leading us here. And, Shreef, I'll give it over to you to provide some opening remarks, please. Thank you very much, Ike. Well, you know, it's always always a pleasure and a privilege to introduce uh, this course. Uh, I wish we could be introducing you and welcoming you in, in person. We have a lovely spring day here in Toronto. Um, but as Ike said, hopefully next year we can we can have you. And you know, there's there's always several silver linings to be found, and it's incredible to see people from all over the world. Uh, uh, attending here, and uh, Ike, I think you have like 1,700 individuals registered, which is uh, just remarkable. Um, uh, I'd like to, uh, of course, uh, thank uh, uh, Kathy and Nicole uh, for being guests and taking time out of their busy schedules to, to attend. Um, and of course, I've got to say a, a big thank you to Ike for uh, putting together this course. It's wonderful to have his uh, expertise in arranging and commenting and talking about uh, all these uh, aspects of uh, cataract and anterior segment surgery. Um, and of course, this year we have, uh, as, as we've had in previous years, we have uh, Dr. Emmon D. Bray uh, uh, joining in and putting the course together with, uh, with Ike. And uh, it's, it's marvelous to see the expertise that Emmon D. has developed um, in cataract surgery over the, the last uh, few years. Um, I thank all of you for, for joining in on your uh, Saturday morning or afternoon. Um, and uh, I know everyone is exhausted with this uh, pandemic. And uh, 
I think it speaks volumes that in spite of being exhausted and doing all that you do, um, that you're attending on a, a day off to enhance your skills uh, in order to provide better patient care. So thank you for, very much for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you and I'll turn things back over to Ike. Fantastic, thank you so much, Sharif. And thank you again for all your support. Um, welcome everybody again to our program. Um, this will be uh, two plus hours of, uh, of discussion on what's new, particularly on IOLs. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, again, formally introduce uh, Dr. Amadeep Rai, who is one of our faculty members at the University of Toronto. Uh, a good friend of mine as well, um, who has really ri risen uh, to become really a strong force here in Toronto and national and internationally. He's associate program director of our residency. Uh, he's a born teacher. He loves to teach. He shares so much of his energy and time with our residents and medical students uh, and our colleagues as well. And uh, looking forward to, to doing this with uh, Dr. Rai, who has been really instrumental in designing this program. Also, we have uh, two other members as well that are guest faculty here. Uh, we have Kathy McCabe from Florida, uh, who has uh, really, um, you know, become an international star with all the new technologies, IOLs, and also a lot of complicated surgeries. I enjoy seeing Kathy push the limits uh, with uh, challenging cases and possible cases and really innovating with new techniques. But she does maintain uh, a real firm understanding and practice in uh, novel technology uh, and, uh, and premium technology as well. And there's, a, there's Nicole Fram, who looks like uh, she you know, it's been awake now for about eight hours, looking great. And thank you so much for joining us. She's on the West Coast. It's a bit early for her. Uh, Nicole also has taken on so many, so many challenging cases. And if you watch her videos and her teaching uh, videos and her approaches, um, they're also great and innovative. Uh, I always enjoy chatting about uh, difficult scenarios. And um, Nicole's always been a very honest and a very credible person. Uh, uh, she really encouraged us to be transparent and honest. And she's, she's made me bear my soul many times. Uh, and so I always appreciate the, the conversations. And so both of our guest speakers are really uh, cutting edge surgeons, but also great human beings and uh, really have contributed so much to our field. The program today is gonna be uh, broken up in terms of uh, two lectures and then cases. Um, both uh, Amadeep and I will speak about new IOLs and injectors, and then we'll get into some cases. Um, the first part will be about uh, 30 minutes or so, and I'm gonna just jump right in and talk about what's new with intraocular lenses. So let me get my... Um, my screen share. I need to, I need to get, uh, I guess, host privileges, Amandeep. And, and while oh, we do I'm that sorry, again, I'll do that, yeah. um, there's a lot new happening here. And I do, I do want to apologize, first of all, just to our international audience, because of course, the availability of new technologies in Canada is a bit limited. So we are going to focus on what's available primarily in North America. In fact, we have technologies that aren't yet available even in the US actually. So, um, but I think a lot of these will be applicable to around the world. So again, welcome to everybody here. I do want to uh, state my financial disclosures are very important because I do work with many industry partners and this does pose an important conflict of interest. And, and I really want to encourage again, all of us to know the evidence, to speak to experts and, uh, and be mindful of course, of all our conflicts and biases that exist when we present material that we otherwise hope will be useful but may potentially have biases in them. You know, the ideal lens, of course, encompasses so many attributes, right? We want it to have the highest quality, no disturbances, perfect alignment, high quality, enhanced range of vision, small incision, biocompatible, and have no uh, defects or reflections. And that's, of course, the ideal lens. Um, we are going to present a lot of technology, and a lot of technology that is presented is from industry. The reality is industry supports studies to get lenses registered. And that, of course, is important as part of the process. And industry is a huge partner in innovation. But, of course, we have to be mindful that, again, industry has a primary mission, which is to, of course, sell lenses. And our job is to, of course, do the best for our patients. So hopefully, many times those interests align, but not always. And I encourage all our audience members, particularly the trainees here, to really be mindful and really seek out the right evidence. It's very hard to present all the evidence, of course, in a short presentation. And, uh, and take me to task. Uh, don't believe the hype is my favorite band when I was growing up. Public Enemy, Pete Number One, uh, you know, in one of their one of their famous songs. So, does the perfect lens exist? Well, of course, the perfect lens doesn't exist. But I will say, I think in 2020, 2021, although we're focused in COVID, um, we have seen a lot of progress, uh, and we're going to share with you some of the new things that are happening. And by the way, we do want to encourage uh, those of you uh, who are interested in asking questions. Amandeep will be taking a, a tally of questions. We'll do polling. And we have the chat group, which I encourage all of you to, uh, to write in as well. 
Um, how do we evaluate a new lens? Well, this is a complicated question, right? You know, of course, it starts with the design, uh, the haptic design, the optic design, um, you know, the, uh, of course, the material design in terms of what the material is made of and the biocompatibility around it. We get into the optics of light transmission, looking at MTF curves, looking at contrast sensitivity. How much does the lens correct aberrations, which can potentially degrade image quality? Defocus curves and range of vision has become topical as we look at different types of presbyopic lenses. Different lenses can filter light. Of course, most, if not all, lenses filter UV light, but other lenses filter a certain amount of other lights that may or may not be helpful. What about the uh, effect of lens position stability and predictability and rotational stability, especially for toric lenses are important. Of course, biocompatibility, capsular reaction, PCO is important as well. And what about the range of lenses, the spherical range, cylindrical range, the increments available to your patient is important, especially those that are out of range. We're all moving to small incisions, of course, is another factor. How does the lens deliver? Is it preloaded? How, how consistent is it? How many people speak about this? And of course, also just photopsy as well. Again, there's no one lens that is perfect. Um, this is just a, a bucket of lenses that uh, on one of my OR days, you can see I, I, I do some glaucoma, of course, as well on many of these days. And it's important that we individualize care. There's no one perfect lens for one individual patient. We have a discussion in lifestyle. We make sure we have good informed discussion. I do firmly believe that the physician and the surgeon should be involved in that discussion. Delegation is helpful, of course, for some of the administrative work, but ultimately we as surgeons have to take responsibility, of course, for making decisions and ensuring patients understand those decisions. What about comorbidities uh, and how do they impact decision-making for IOLs? There's no question we won't cover it today, but the biometry, IOL calculations and formula and keratometry is critical as well. Where do we target the patient? Don't assume everyone wants Plano. Surgical technique, post-op and second eye planning are all important considerations. One point I think we all are, of course, really uh, have really become comfortable with is attacking astigmatism. Most patients will benefit from it, although not everybody needs to write astigmatism, but certainly with some of the presbyopic lenses, I think this is an important area to address. So what's new in lenses in 2020 plus one? Well, what's not new, of course, is the lockdown here in Toronto. So we won't speak about that much, but technology really has evolved significantly over the last few decades, right? In the past, we really primarily had monofocal IOLs mainly. We moved into refractive multifocals like the array lens, had a number of different issues of quality of vision and dysphotopsia. Diffractive multifocals ushered a new era of multifocality with improved contrast. Uh, we saw now the um, introduction of extended range of vision and EDOF lenses with the Symphony lens. We saw trifocals come out like the fine vision trifocal and the panoptics trifocal. We see now the uh, modified monofocal lenses like the IHANS lens, and we see another form of EDOF lens, the Vividi lens. We see further blending of EDOF and multifocal technology like the Synergy lens. So you can see it's a really busy field. And these are only some of the lenses that are primarily available here in Canada. There's a whole ton of them available around the world, as many of you know, that we don't have access to that are also should be part of this, part of this slide as well. So we'll speak about next generation multifocals here. We'll talk about some of the new EDOFs and also we'll talk about some of the confusions in this area as well in nomenclature. And we'll talk about monofocals that perhaps give you an extra bounce. And again, like I said, we're focusing on Canada. Hopefully all of you know where Canada is. It's a beautiful, huge, big country with so much diversity in geography, in, in persuasion, uh, in, um, in race, creed, uh, gender, orientation. Uh, we're proud of our country. We do have a lot of work to do, of course, still uh, to bring things to be fair and universal, uh, but our system uh, really um, uh, continues, I think, to serve our population. With our patients, of course, we see an evolution to patients that really are moving more toward intermediate and near tasks, especially with mobile phones and tablets and computers. This is not just for the young, uh, quote unquote, young population. This is also for patients who are mid middle age and also older population as well. If anything, COVID has really um, pushed people to uh, be comfortable with remote access as well. Now, near vision, again, is not just the old wearing glasses for reading. Near vision, many patients mean tasks that are required within an arm's length away, for example, uh, computer, cell phone, other things as well. We have to be careful with that. How do we classify lenses? Well, it's difficult. And this is something that a few of us have discussed. I kind of divide them very simply between patients who are single lenses that are single focused lenses, like monofocal lenses, 
on lenses that have more range of vision. You can consider them as mild range of vision, extended range of vision, and full range of vision. Full range of visions will be multifocals. Eat off lenses would be more as, as extended range of visions. And then the mild range of visions may be those monofocal plus type of lenses that aren't quite eat off, but maybe give you a little bit more than a simple, straightforward monofocal lens. I would encourage all of us that are thinking about different lenses, particularly in the presbyopic arena, to just understand defocus curves, right? Um, these curves tell us the ability of a lens to, of course, see things at different focal ranges, and there are different ways to test this. Most commonly, we basically put a defocus in front of a patient's that's distance corrected lens and see whether the image is still clear or not and what acuity they have. A monofocal lens, for example, in red, basically will, of course, have excellent visual acuity at a, at a zero defocus, but will degrade as you go down to closer focal points. Depending on the ad, this graph shows, shows different bifocal lenses for 3.25 and 75 ad will again provide peaks at different focal distances. This again correlates to working distances. And for us at least, we don't think in diopters in terms of patient working distances, but they can correlate that again to again patient needs. And I encourage us all to think about where our patients do their work and where their interest is in most of their lives. We can correlate these defocus curves to function. For example, of course, a distance focus is of course at a zero defocus. A 2.5 or 3 uh, minus 2.5 minus 3 would be more of a near, like reading books, cell phone, things like that, newspapers. Well, intermediate or middle distance would be more tablets, cooking, dashboard, uh, multimedia, computer work. So it's important, again, to just think about where do we want to, or where do our patients, I should say, desire to be focused? And again, you can talk, we can talk more rather than focus zones, more on lifestyle. Patients don't think of intermediate vision. They think of computer vision or looking at the dashboard. So I encourage us to use the right terminology for our patients so that our patients who, again, are not ophthalmologists understand what we're driving for, what expectations are. The reality is many patients will be fine with a monofocal lens for distance and wearing glasses for everything else. And that's completely reasonable, but it's important that we at least let patients know the expectations as well. There are different ways, of course, to correct vision. Distance, Plano would be typical. Multifocal lenses, of course, can enhance range of visions as EDOFs can, and then there's monovision as well. I, for one, do like to test ocular dominance, although this is, bit, this is a bit controversial perhaps, especially when we're thinking about offsetting targets, whether it's micro, mini, or full monovision, whether it's with monofocals or whether it's with EDOF lenses. It is, I believe it is helpful to know the dominance of the eye, unless it's a dense cataract, which of course can cause some switching. And I typically would target the distance vision in that dominant eye which is typically right for most patients. When it comes to picking the right presbyopic lenses, again, it's about talking about the patients. There is no free lunch, I will tell you, with any particular lens. Whenever there's manipulation of light, there is going to be a trade-off. And that trade-off can be in visual quality or just photopsia. Some of the new lenses, however, have reduced some of the trade-offs with maintaining visual quality while enhancing range of vision and reducing this photopsia. And that's where we'll share some discussion and we need more evidence on this as well. Most of us as surgeons, of course, uh, are interested in these lenses, but our biggest reason for dissatisfaction, again, is typically dysphotopsia, contrast sensitivity uh, remain issues. And of course, full spectacle independence is also important as well. All things to consider. Of course, there's many different considerations when it comes to picking lenses. We talked about biometry. The personality discussion is huge in terms of how that person patient is in terms of expectation management. And of course, be very mindful for any comorbidities, whether they're obvious or not. And this is where technology like topography and OCT can be helpful to assess a potential risk for dissatisfaction for any lens. Full range of vision lenses typically diffract light in different ways. Um, and they attempt to increase the range of vision, particularly in a continuous fashion as we go into modern lens technologies. We also try to minimize side effects of these technologies. Now, there are many different diffractive lenses out there. I will briefly go out what's available here, but I will focus a little bit on what's new. Panoptics is the market leader. That's the reality. I'm not doing any marketing. That is the market leader, certainly here in North America. It's become the trifocal, multifocal of choice. It has, I think, an excellent range of vision, transmits the majority of light compared to other bifocals, and provides, again, that distance and in intermediate near. Of course, it's a multifocal lenses, and there is some contrast changes, and there is some dysphotopsia as well. However, the intermediate near distance, as you can see, 
uh, up to uh, here, uh, 40 to 35 centimeters, uh, can be excellent with a fairly flat continuous um, range here. Zeiss is new in Canada, although around the world has been around for many years. And the Zeiss trifocal, the AT Lisa, is a trifocal lens um, with, again, intermediate, near, and distance focus. Um, it comes in a different design, a more plate lens design, a single piece design, and can fit to small incisions. Again, very, very studied. Of interest to those of you here in Canada, as well as around the world, I find uh, particularly helpful for patients who need large amounts of cylinder correction, typically as a monofocal here. 12 diopters cylinder on the lens with 0.5 increments is an incredible amount of, to treat for those patients with regular astigmatism that need a high cylinder torque. Many of our torques available aren't available beyond four to five diopters a cylinder. The fine vision torque is new here in Canada as well. Uh, again, a trifocal design uh, with a modified haptic design. Uh, one of the first trifocals that have been around and it shows excellent contrast and sensitivity here as well. And you can see again, the availability of this lens in a bit of a higher dioptic range here that's present here. Both the, um, both the uh, trifocal torque and the trifocal are here available in Canada. The Lentis lens is a bit less commonly used. And however, some surgeons who use it have had a lot of success with it, particularly in, in Europe. Did have some issues I will just add as far as calcification, although those seem to have resolved now with the new manufacturing process. There's a 1.5, two and a three add. Uh, that, 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 that is available. And this is a segmental bifocal. Interestingly enough, a rotational asymmetrical bifocal here where you can see the add on the bottom here basically provides that uh, near focus while the center and the rest of the optic is designed for distance. When you first look at this, you go, really, is that lens gonna work? Is it gonna sit right? Are patients gonna be dissatisfied with flare or other problems? And it seems like many patients are happy with it and there's no rings on this. So the dysphotopsia may be less, at least in the classical sense. Um, and so this is also uh, available here in Canada as well. This just shows you again, the different zone focusing here from near, intermediate and far. The Synergy lens is new on the market here and we'll focus on this a little bit here. And you can see in red where the Synergy lies. You can compare to the Zeiss and the Panoptis lens, which again are two excellent trifocal lenses. The Synergy does give more on the near side of things, particularly for patients who need, who want that really close vision. As well, this kind of combines the, the benefit of a EDOF design with a continuous range of vision with a multifocal design. And that's kind of one of the things that has been touted with this lens. The other thing is with the, with the chromatic and spherical aberration correction of this lens, um, there appears to be some improvement in terms of low contrast vision and light scatter. Uh, also with the, uh, with the violet filtering design of this lens. And again, I say appears because this is of course brand new in the market and we need to see more, but at least some of the bench testing on MTF curves show an improvement in low image contrast for smaller and medium sized pupils, which of course is always something we're thinking about when it comes to multifocal lenses. Let's move to EDOF lenses here. And again, EDOFs have been particularly designed to address potentially, I should say, two major issues with multifocal lenses while retaining a benefit of having increased range of vision. Issues with low, low, lowering contrast and, and quality of vision and issues with dysphotopsia. How do we extend depth of focus? Well, we can induce spherical aberration with lens technologies or in the cornea when it comes to LASIK. There can be a refractive power change along the optic itself. Diffractive designs can also create EDOF, EDOF technologies. Wavefront shaping we'll talk about. Pinhole designs are now being studied and available in parts of the world, as well as hybrid designs as well. As far as the ANSI criteria, I won't go into too much detail, but there are four criteria to meet to be classified as an EDOF lens. And this is again, based on the American uh, ANSI criteria. Notice again, depth of focus, intermediate vision um, and, uh, and range of vision are all parts of the definition of an EDOF. Some lenses are out there that, that achieve a couple of these criteria, but not all of them. But at least here in North America, there are only two that meet all the criteria. Notice by the way, there are no ANSI criteria for EDOF lenses when it comes to visual disturbances. In, a, in Canada, there are two lenses that are defined as EDOF based on ANSI at least, the Symphony lens and the Vividi lens. I put IHANS in here, but it doesn't meet all the criteria on ANSI, but it does have some qualities of an EDOF lens. I don't want to confuse people, and that may be a source of confusion, but I put that separately here, but I put it on this slide here. Symphony, of course, is available. It's not new. Um, we've seen um, the elongated focus on the bottom with the Symphony lens. And we've seen the defocus curve you can see here 
in yellow, how is shifted over by a diopter here across the intermediate and near compared to uh, the monofocal lens. And so this does meet criteria for Edoff lens. And one of the benefits here, the contrastivity appears to be more monofocal-like compared to multifocal lenses, which is one of the potential benefits of this lens platform with the EDOF design, which is important for certain patients, of course, with contrast. However, we have to remember, this is still a diffractive design. There are still rings on this lens. And as we know, there are still a risk for halos and glare. That's important when we consent patients for this lens. So what about wavefront shaping? This is new. We see the design here looks very much like a monofocal, but there's a central area, which is subtle, but visible when you slightly tilt the lens. It's a central zone here, 2.2 millimeter zone of elevation. The small elevation here basically is only one micron thick. And this, uh, this allows light as it comes through to stretch and also to shift the light a little bit on the myopic side to produce more of an elongated focus. This is what some people have termed wavefront shaping. Some people have even called this appears to be a bit of a zonal refractive design, and we can debate that. But the idea again is as light is passed through the periphery, it's focused to a distance focus, but near the center with that round circular elevation, light comes in, it stretches and shifts here to provide that intermediate and near focus. There is no classical light splitting as occurs with a multifocal lens. And you can see on these light transmission curves, you can see again, how the Vividi lens here has more of an elongated focus as opposed to more multifocality where there are some gaps uh, within the, uh, the visual spectrum. And so this is the defocus curve as you can see here. There is, a, there is some extension of focus, particularly intermediate, but the near I will mention is not the same as the multifocal. And that's important as we talk about it with our patients here. Again, still there's enhanced near compared to a monofocal. And that certainly is one benefit. It does meet the criteria, I should say, for EDOF. And what we have found by offsetting the non-dominant eye, for example, by 0.5 diopters, it gives us a little bit of extra for that near focus for patients that really still want to have that near focus. The real value though of this lens is a reduction of dysphotopsia. And the clinical studies have shown that the dysphotopsia risk is very similar, if not equivalent to a monofocal. That's been our clinical experience. And that's exciting because we can extend range of vision without the unwanted side effects that we get from multifocal lenses. This again, I will say is evolving, but it appears to be consistent based on our work. What about contrast sensitivity? I don't wanna get into too much detail here, but this is for example, a sine wave gradient is classically used looking at contrast. And as we look at the monocular studies, we can see here in blue is vividity. Now on the high spatial frequencies on monofocal, monocular testing, there is some reduction of contrast, which meets uh, the ANSI criteria for clinical significant loss. Question is how significant is it? And many of us do question, if we look at the actual loss, it's basically the equivalent of two circles on the 18 CPD sine wave gratings. And that's very subtle. And the question is how clinical is, is it? Binocular testing, however, has shown that the contrast sensitivity loss is not, not clinically significant based on ISO standards. So this is something that I still put out there as a question. Finally, let's talk about the uh, IHANS lens, which is basically what's labeled as a refractive aspheric. The lens looks exactly the same as a typical monofocal lens, indistinguishable. Spherical aberration is, is, very, is exactly the same as a typical one-piece lens, um, but there's a central area of power that is delivered to this, to this lens. And this provides a greater intermediate zone of vision, less so on near, and less so compared to a vividity, for example, in our experience. And if you look at the actual anterior surface of the lens, it's a very subtle change in the curvature, which provides a small increase in the range of vision uh, for, this, for this lens in the central area that enhances the intermediate zone. The J&J uh, &J, uh, has consistently said this does not change the this is not an aspheric change, although people do debate this question, but it does provide this enhanced. And the one benefit is that we do have a bigger, bigger sweet spot when it comes to targeting. Uh, because of this uh, larger um, bull, bullseye of this, of this uh, lens compared to, for example, a monofocal lens. And one of the benefits here is the contrast sensitivity really is monofocal-like. There's very little question that this lens acts in a safety fashion similar to monofocal lens. Again, also, photic phenomena, dysphotopsy, very similar to monofocal lenses. What do we call the eye hands? I think this is still a question. It's not quite a need off, so we can't really call it a need off based on clinical criteria. Refractive monofocal, monofocal plus, enhanced monofocal, a mild range of vision lens you can all talk about. 
And some people argue, well, an aspherically neutral lens may be similar to this because it does use spherical aberration or, or, or in, still retains spherical aberration in the eye that can provide some range of vision. So this is still a debate, but there is some benefit as we see compared to the technus monofocal. I think I look at these both of these lenses, Vividi and Ihans, as lenses that really have minimal impact on dysphotopsia and, and visual disturbances and have similar contrast to monofocal lenses. Although I will say the Ihans, I think is more monofocal like with contrast. The Vividi, there might be some changes and some loss, but it's very minimal. I think these are important lenses as options for patients who don't want night vision disturbances and maybe for eyes with pathology. We'll talk about this as well. Finally, remember, I've, I've just reviewed all these new lenses. That's a lot of information here. We still have to individualize our particular lens for an individual patient, and hopefully the cases will discuss that. So I'll, I'll stop here, and uh, I know there's a lot of information here. I'm sure the cases, I hope, will bring out some of the differences in different lenses, and I'll hand over to Amadeep to speak about delivery systems. Thanks, Amadeep. All right, thank you, Ike. That was an excellent introduction. Lots, lots of new information, lots of new IOLs. It's an exciting time to be a cataract surgeon. Uh, before I start my talk, I know we've got the, the chat box going, but it is always nice to see where people are um, attending from. And we do want audience participation today. So this is, this is a trial run, just so everyone, everyone can get used to the polling. We'll be doing a lot of this today. So where's everyone from? So we've got about 50% voted. Let's give it another couple of seconds. And here we are. So the majority of our audience is North American from Canada or the US, as well as the Caribbean and South America. But we do have people from, from Europe and Africa and Asia, as well as the Middle East. I guess it's kind of late out in Australia, um, but we do have good representation from across the world. So it's a pleasure to have everyone here uh, with us this morning. I am going to just get my screen share here. So I hope you can all see that. Uh, again, I first want to thank Ike um, for the invite to be here today. Um, I did look it up and he started this course way back in 2003. So Ike, I guess your baby is now an adult, uh, officially 18 years old. So congratulations to you. Um, it's been a, such a fun time the last few years putting this course together with you and being a part of it. Um, and I've really enjoyed your IG videos this last week promoting this course. I, I put me on an IG live yesterday and about five minutes later, I had like 20 new followers. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> I might have to start posting on there. In addition to the new lens technologies, I think one of the other innovations that have come out recently are preloaded IOLs. And that's something I wanna touch on briefly here. So why might we, why might we want preloaded IOLs? Well, a preloaded pre IOL has the possibility or the potential for more consistent, reliable, and reproducible IOL delivery. And this may have some impact um, on the corneal incision. By using a fully packaged and disposable delivery system, you eliminate the need for sterilization. And um, as you know, with the, with the reusable systems, they have to go through sterilization. And although this will be very difficult to prove in a large scale study, uh, because of how rare the event rates are, this may have some theoretical benefit with reducing rates of TAS or endophthalmitis. Of course, a preloaded system does offer efficiency, and that's um, always an important factor. And because they are no touch techniques, you avoid any potential for a misloaded or scratched or damaged IOL. And we've all been there in this situation um, that, that I've demonstrated on the right, you, you manually loaded the IOL there's a scratch and sometimes we leave it, but personally um, I'm very, very particular. So I have a low threshold for exchanging lenses and um, I do end up doing that. So potentially a preloaded IOL will reduce the, the need for that. And it is not staff dependent. So some of you may be thinking that this is not such a big deal. And I bet you probably operate at a center with dedicated ophthalmology nurses, but that's not true for everyone in this audience. Some of you may be working at a large hospital and sometimes your nurses are in orthopedics and then other days are in general surgery and sometimes they're in your OR. And these are often the nurses who are least comfortable uh, loading lenses and quite nervous about this. So why not have preloaded IOLs? Well, as I said, um, sometimes the nurses and the doctors are actually quite adept at loading their IOLs and they may not really see a need 
for a preloaded IOL system. There is a, an environmental impact of a fully disposable system that is not recycled. There's additional cost to the system or the patient. And past attempts have frankly been lackluster. Um, I am someone who trialed the new preloaded IOLs with a healthy dose of skepticism. I have in the past, frankly, used the Acrosoft UltraCert and the Technus iTech preloaded systems. And I wasn't that impressed. I found that I ended up reverting back to a manually loaded uh, technique. And I think for me, the minimum standard for a preloaded IOL is that the delivery should be at least on par uh, or better than the manually loaded IOL. So um, with that said, I'm going to introduce you to three uh, preloaded injector systems that I've had the privilege of using here in Canada over the last few months. The first is the Invista Simplify. And so you can see the um, delivery system on the top right. And this delivers the Invista um, monofocal IOL. So that's, it's not yet available in, in the Toric. And the Invista, as you know, is a hydrophobic acrylic intraocular lens, but it does have a slightly higher water content and comes in a bath of water. And this is true of both the regularly loaded or manually loaded IOL, as well as the preloaded IOL. So the preloaded IOL is pictured here. It comes loaded in a cartridge that's in a bath of water. And you basically have to uh, assemble that. So inject it into the, um, into the injector and advance the plunger. So I've got a video here. Oh, and what you're, what you're basically seeing here is that the, the lens comes in a uh, bath of water. There is a tail on the cartridge and that points towards the back. When you, when you pull back the plunger, one tip is if you just pull back gently, the plunger may not be all the way withdrawn and you need it to be flush. So make sure you give it a little extra tug and get it flush or else you may have issues with the injection. Um, once you install the cartridge, you will hear an audible click. And then you fill the cartridge with the viscoelastic of your choice. I do prefer a uh, cohesive viscoelastic for easy removal afterwards. And the rest of this is pretty simple. It's what we're used to. So you, you advance the plunger and then with the corkscrew design, you rotate it into position. And the delivery of the system is, or the delivery of the IOL is very smooth. There's no issues with either the trailing or the leading haptic. And I find that the lens unfolds um, at a very reasonable rate. So, and, and also I've had no issues with the, with the trailing uh, haptic getting stuck on the plunger. So I've been quite pleased with that. The second system that I've had the privilege of using is the Technus Simplicity. So not to get confused with the Simplify, this is the Simplicity. And as the name suggests, it actually is quite simple. Um, so the Simplicity is currently available with the Technus Monofocal. So that's the ZC Boo lens as well as the iHands lens that Ike has already gone over. And it really is a very simple delivery system. So it comes out of the box um, as one piece as pictured in the top right. And there is a unique thing about this lens in that you can fill the cartridge with either BSS or viscoelastic. So you can choose to use BSS. Um, and once that's done, you basically advance the plunger and rotate the corkscrew into position. The manufacturer does suggest that once you've prepared the lens with either um, BSS or OBD that you allow it to sit and hydrate for about three to 10 minutes. Although personally, I have not found this to be necessary. I've been, I've been planted over a dozen of these as well as the, the Simplify and I've had no issues um, with respect to with, with time on either of those. And finally, the, um, the third preloaded system that I talked to you about is the Clarion Autonomy. And actually there's two innovations with this lens. So the first is the Clarion material itself. And so traditionally the Alcon material is the Acrosoft and the physical design of the lens, um, the Clarion is very similar to the Acrosoft that you're familiar with. It, it appears virtually identical to the naked eye. And one of the concerns of course, historically with the Acrosoft material has been glistenings. And there is research that demonstrates that glistenings are less of an issue uh, now than they were in the 90s with the Acrosoft material, not to say they're eliminated, but certainly less. And that is mostly attributable to advances in the manufacturing process. The Clarion represents uh, changes with respect to the actual materials um, process. And the big change is that there's been a change in one of the monomers from HEMA to HEMA. And what that means for us 
is the water content has increased in this lens from about 0.5% to about 1.5%. And this change has been demonstrated both in vivo as well as with other um, manufacturers and trocular lenses to reduce glistening formation. Now, personally, I've had about three months uh, follow up with this lens and I've been very impressed with the clarity, but there is also uh, longer term clinical studies as well as anecdotal evidence from surgeons abroad um, indicating that there is improved uh, clarity with respect to comparing the Clarion to the traditional Acrosoft material. The other innovation with this lens, of course, is that it's a preloaded system. And so the preparation for this lens is quite simple uh, as well. You fill the cartridge with a viscoelastic. I do recommend for this particular lens to use a dispersive viscoelastic. Uh, once you fill the cartridge, you remove the uh, lockout assembly and you depress the, the plunger to advance the lens. So I'll show you that here. Here I'm using a cohesive, but I do recommend a dispersive viscoelastic. And once you remove the uh, lockout assembly, you simply depress on the plunger. And that basically pierces a CO2 canister in the device, which then allows for very smooth, continuous delivery of the um, intraocular lens. Based on how, how hard you depress the plunger, you can control the speed of the delivery. And here's the surgeon's view um, for this. So the, the lens is unfolded in its um, package state. And once you depress the plunger, it, for, it moves forward into the ready position. Once there, you have about a minute to deliver the lens and the delivery is one-handed, very smooth. Um, and I've had no issues again with the leading or the trailing haptic or the plunger when using the dispersive. I will mention that rarely, again, not, all, not consistently, but rarely if you use a cohesive viscoelastic, you may notice that the leading haptic um, comes out straight, but I have not seen that to be the case with the um, with, with dispersive viscoelastic. So uh, with that said, I mean, that's a very quick uh, summary of some of the new uh, injector systems that are available to us. I will again say that I had a healthy dose of skepticism when um, I was asked to trial these lenses, um, but I had been pleasantly surprised with all three of the systems. I will say that I um, have enjoyed using all three and I will continue to use all three because I, I do feel that these injector systems are at least as good, if not better than the manually delivered um, lenses. Thank you very much, Amadi. Thanks for that uh, great review on delivery systems. And we, we all love the idea of preloaded. I mean, just the, you know, the ability to keep the lens off the field and um, reduce the, uh, the tech potential issues. Uh, I've even been caught myself sometime loading a lens, not so great. So it's a great idea. Well, let's, um, let's get into our cases. Um, Amadi uh, and our faculty have prepared some nice cases to go through. Um, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, I will be here for, uh, for as long as we want to be here myself, but I also um, want to be mindful of, uh, of Nicole and Kathy's time as well. So um, we, will, we will get started and I look forward to having discussions. I wanted to, before go there though, I wanted to get, um, maybe we'll start with Kathy, just for your general thoughts about, you know, what's new and exciting for you in the last couple of years um, with lenses. Uh, and then I'll ask the same question to Nicole. So go over to you, Kathy. Yeah, I mean, I think for my practice, there's been a big shift to simplifying my discussion with patients is the first thing. So having a, a lens that reliably gives patients distance and then a range, kind of a smooth range between intermediate and near. And by that, I mean panoptics. Um, that's really simplified my discussion of having to say, you know, we have a lens that's distance intermediate or a lens that's distance and near. What is intermediate? Patients don't really know what intermediate is to begin with. I don't really have to go over a lot of that anymore if that's the choice. And then with Vividi, I have the ability to expand the number of patients that I'm offering anything that expands their range of vision. So for me, those have been two big changes and they're both really recent. And, uh, and I think I feel a lot more confident being able to offer some sort of improved range of vision for almost all my patients now. That's a good point. You know, I, I, I will say that the discussion can be very complicated. And I think the more complicated it gets, it, it's really confusing for our patients. So I think, yeah, the way you've kind of looked at it more simply in some ways, I think is, is important. How about you, Nicole? Yeah, I've had a similar uh, experience. For, for me, I was only putting in about 10% multifocal. 
um, up until the panoptics and Vividy became available. And now iHands for specific patients to just kind of work on that micro mono. So the confidence that I have now uh, in the fact that these technologies are actually delivering is much bigger than it used to be. Um, however, I always tell the patient that if they're having a problem, I'm gonna help them. And so as long as you know how to take it out and you tell them that there is you know, one to 3% chance that this might happen, it's just a, a nicer way to communicate with the patient. But the difference for me is that the technology is actually delivering. Yeah, I, I like that point too. I, I think I, I think more and more surgeons are getting comfortable with the need to potentially exchange a lens. And I think that's always something you have to have in the back of your mind. And I think if you're doing it within the first three or four months, I think it's quite predictable. It's rare to do, mind you, but when you need to do it, it's nice to have that confidence and that reassuring uh, aspect of it. Um, Maybe a question for you. I mean, some people have asked these questions as well, but I mean, with the eye hands profile, meaning, you know, appears to have very similar, uh, you know, contrast, this photopsia risk is pretty well the same. You know, why not, why wouldn't this be the lens for everybody? Give them a bit more intermediate. Putting cost aside, for example, there is more cost, but what are your thoughts on that? In comparison to a monofocal lens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I guess that's a great question. The contrast loss is minimal as you demonstrated. I do find that the, and again, this is not um, every patient, but it's not completely comparable to a monofocal in terms of uh, dysphotopsis. There is a rare patient who with the eye hands is still complaining of glare. Um, and so with respect to a, a monofocal, I, I certainly think an argument could be made that it could be the, um, the monofocal for all, but. For, for some discerning patients, there may be some complaints with respect to glare. So um, that's the hesitation there. And then with respect to uh, presbyopia correction, I think we'll, we'll get into that um, in some of the cases, but um, you, ha you have to do, you may have to get a little bit creative with your targeting. Yeah, and I, and I should have mentioned earlier that, that you know, and I'm, I'm glad we have control groups because the reality is even with monofocal lenses, like the standard classical monofocal, there are a subset of patients who will get dysphotopsia. Uh, Nicole is, you know, world expert on this and I think can comment a lot uh, on this. Maybe you can make a few comments, Nicole, on both positive and negative. Cause I've seen, uh, and I know you've handled it. In fact, I, you know, you, you were involved in a patient that I, I know as well. And, and it was a monofocal lens. Everything was great, but the patient had these starbursts, right? And it's, it's edge, it's, it's effective optic zone. It's everything for monofocal. Any, any comments on that? Just in terms of even just discussion with patients, even for a monofocal lens. Yeah, I, you know, when I consent a patient, you know, often they'll say, well, what are the risks? And I say, you know, one in 10,000 infection in our center. Um, and I go through the motions. And then I do say, every lens is plastic and you're going to get a little bit of glare. And if you have a problem, I'll help you. And really in our, our studies that we've seen is that we can't make the optic size bigger yet. Um, we can with a CZ70 and a huge incision, but we don't want to do that. Um, and we have mainly square edge lenses. So what we need to do is change the index of refraction to a lower index of refraction. So a silicone BNL LI61AO is kind of the only thing that we can do at this point for a small incision surgery to decrease their issues. But I, we have seen this with every lens. So it's not, you can't say, you know, I'm gonna use Invista because there's less dysphotopsia versus ZCBU versus SN60 WF, they all, have it. Um, the key is distinguishing between diffractive dysphotopsia and, you know, the positive dysphotopsia classically defined as from an oblique light and the square edge design. So, you know, understanding those issues is key, but these patients just need to be told that I'm going to try and do something to help you. And by changing the index of refraction of, of, the, of the IOL material, it can decrease your symptoms by 88% is what we're saying at this point. Kathy, um, there's been some questions that come up here and it's related to this question I'm gonna ask you. We have different lenses with different amounts of asphericity. Um, some lenses that add negative circle aberration to counteract the positive on the cornea of a certain amount, some that have zero. Uh, there was a comment that the ones that have zero may in fact add some range of vision access that may be a benefit for some patients. Do you incorporate circle aberration correction in any way or do you measure it or do you kind of pick certain lenses based on the circle aberration or, or no? Well, for the most part, no, for an average cornea that hasn't had a keratorefractive refractive procedure, but if they have, then I do think it's important to consider that. 
So it is important to know, do they have a myopic LASIK treatment or a hyperopic LASIK treatment? You know, are they an RK patient? So for hyperopic, especially in RK patients, um, usually I'll put a neutral asphericity lens. You could make, and there was an argument in the past for putting positive spherical aberration lenses, but there's really so much variability in those patients that really a neutral asphericity is probably the right choice. So that's usually what I go for. So in that respect, complicated cases, complicated corneas, yes, but otherwise, no. Okay, great. There's some questions that have come up, which is a great question about the available range. And that is a good point, particularly for Vividity, we are limited. Um, offhand, does anyone know? I think it's like 15 to 25. Yeah. What is it, Kathy? It is. Yeah, it's 15 or 25 yeah. and up to a T5, which is a little bit more than two diopters at the, at the corneal plane. Yeah, great. And I should also add, there's a question that came up about astigmatism correction. Um, I think it's important, particularly for presbyopic lenses. And, you know, here in Canada, we do have the T2 available, like for low cylinder powers. In the U.S., you don't. And you, I, I know that you, I'm sure you use uh, arcuates for that. And that's something I think that, that we have found to be important uh, for that as well. Before we get into the cases, there's an I, important case. We I, have can a, I, oh, can sorry, I just Shree. ask? I didn't, you, I didn't see it. There you go. And panel, um, what, what do you do with, uh, with a patient who has glaucoma or uh, diabetes or an epiretinal membrane that is questioning uh, some range of vision with their IOL? What do you tell them? I mean, personally, I think you have some choices, right? You can, you can decide to use like a mini monovision, something with an extended depth of focus. It's a neutral asphericity lens. Like in Vista, you could choose, I think, Vividity because of its uh, visual disturbance profile and the fact that it doesn't split light or maybe iHance. So I think that's one of the things that we have a, an advantage of now is we have choices that are appropriate for cases that are sort of borderline like that, at least in my practice. I'm yeah, not- great question. I know we're going get to some, get some cases on this as well, but but uh, it's a really, really good question and, and we have options. But Nicole, go ahead. You know, I... I need to see the evidence on this. So right now in my practice for an epiretinal membrane, particularly with, you know, microcysts um, in the retina, they are getting, you know, a mini monovision at best, um, even micro monovision. I'm curious to see what the eye hands is going to do in these eyes. Um, and Vividity, I really think with these Alcon lenses, you still have to hit your targets. All the astigmatism has to be corrected and you must hit your targets for these lenses to perform. So What's interesting about the eye enhance is that, you know, it may perform and you have this wider landing zone. And so that's where I am right now. Great feedback, great feedback. Um, there's been a number of questions here and I'll just start off with one here because this is uh, an ophthalmologist who was a high myope. I had a panoptis a year ago, loves it, but some dysphotopsia. Now Ismail is preparing for the right eye, okay? And he's asking whether he should consider a vividity. So it sounds like he's pretty happy. He loves it, but there's some dysphotopsia. That was his left eye. He was a high myope. Now the right eye, assuming the available, the power is available. What do you think? Is that a good idea? Or would you stick to the panoptis, which it sounds like he's overall happy with? Which eye is his dominant eye? I would want to know. Let's assume the right eye is his dominant eye, which is the eye that's going to cataract surgery now. I'll assume that. So, you know, I have some patients like this and I have put Vividity in that eye and there are other, and usually if it's a dominant eye, I think it's even better because we want the best distance, a quality of vision for that patient. And it does decrease the risk of having what he's already noticed and likely to see in his, in his fellow eye as dysphotopsia. So I, I, I have patients like that that have done really well. I think it's a good strategy. Nicole, your thoughts? Do you do, you do, do you do, I mean, just in general question about mixing and matching? Yeah, I, you know, I have some uh, just because they came from other doctors. I'm not a mixer and matcher if you're happy with the first eye. I have done the Vividity and a monofocal um, for, you know, a mild epi, epiretinal membrane in the other eye and I didn't feel comfortable. Uh, so that's, you know, I, I, because my patients just sit there and do this all day. <laughs> <laughs> So no, I have to tell them they can't do that. I know, but they don't <laughs> listen. <that> <laughs> they don't listen. So I'm not a big mixer and matcher. I'm going to tell you one thing. I, I, I have a verbal contract with my patients, and I say, thou shall not cover one eye and compare them. And if you do, all warranties and guarantees are void. Right. <laughs> I, I think this is really, I'm kind of subtly saying this. I really think like that's something that we have to discourage our patients from doing, not to hide anything. Because when they come to the office, I tell them, we will test each eye, don't worry. But we have, we need our brains to adapt. And whether it's a monofocal or whatever it is, monovision, I think that's really important. Um, Amadi, what about you? Are you a mix and, are you a mix and matcher? Yeah, so I mean, this exact scenario I have done, 
um, with the with the dominant eye being a EDOF and the non-dominant eye, presumably this is a non-dominant eye being a left eye, um, being a trifocal lens. And I have been quite happy with this. And actually one of the cases that we have coming up later um, is, is an example of such. So uh, I, I'm not opposed to it. Uh, and it, He sounds happy. So, I mean, if he's happy with the, with the trifocal, certainly you can um, go ahead with trifocal again in the right eye. But I think there can be an argument to be made for the range of vision that uh, Enidov can complement the trifocal with. And okay. you, I just wanted to add to, I think this is like the perfect example of how you engage the patient in understanding what you're doing and why you're doing it and what the po positive and negatives of the approach are. And so, I mean, I'll tell them specifically, you know what, you have some glare and halos because that comes with the territory and the type of technology that gives you that better near vision in your first eye. And we're going to try a different strategy. It has these positives and negatives and, you know, really don't do this thing because we are doing different uh, strategies in each eye. But I think if you live your life, like we normally do with both eyes open, you're going to get this advantage. And I think part of it's just really communicating effectively with the patient what to expect. Yeah. In the end of the day, that's a great point, Kathy. I, I, I will say my bias is generally to avoid mixing and matching. I, I know we probably have some cases on this or unilateral implantations. I, I think I, I know people have been successful, but it, it introduces another variable that already there's some questions sometimes with these lenses. So, but I will, I will, I will defer to those that have done it more. Um, I wonder if we can get Sharif back here because I did want to make sure we take a group picture and the picture that Sharif has up here is with him with short hair. I want to bring him back if he's still available here to at least get a group picture and everybody smile nicely. Okay. For a group picture here, we've got to, we've got to remember this, these times. Okay. Ready? One, two, three, ready? Smile. Okay, good. Back to our regular programming. Thanks, Sharif. <laughs> <laughs> and please join us Sharif, for the cases as well. You're always astute with your observations. Let's go to our cases. Amadeep, are you good to go? Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to share okay. the slides? Yes, I will yeah, do that please. now. And so these are cases. There's been a lot of great questions that have come up here and we will get to as many as we can. We will spend some time after as well, but I think the cases will bring out some of the, uh, some of the things that uh, have been asked here already. So uh, with Amandeep's help, you may want to help me just to kind of uh, review, review these cases. I don't know if you want to present this, Amandeep, um, sure. but uh, why don't you go ahead for the first case? Sure. So, I mean, we'll start off easy. So we've got a very easy going patient here. She's an 85 year old woman, um, visually significant cataracts. She hadn't even considered the possibility that this might be a refractive procedure as well. Um, and her hobbies are basically going for walks, daily and baking with her grandkids. And so we will do a poll here and ask the audience, assuming that the rest of our eye exam is within normal limits, what would you suggest for this patient who really comes in with minimal expectations of you? And while the audience is doing that, perhaps we can get the panelists to weigh in on what they do with these patients who, who are pretty easy going. Yes, so Maybe this- Nicole? Yep. Yeah, this is the biggest change in my practice. So I used to just say, okay, we'll just set you for distance in your wear reading glasses. And if you notice what they're doing right now is, is cooking and baking. Um, so I really love the vividity for this patient. I just don't have the amount of stress that I used to have before about dystrotopsia with this lens. There definitely are some, and I consent them for that. Um, but it's really interesting how there's just a total shift. I just say, you can have distance, you wear reading glasses for everything arm's length in, or I can give you something where you have computer, uh, intermediate, you know, baking in this patient. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then when you read at night right here, you need to put on some reading glasses. And it's just, a, it's a very short conversation. Kathy? Yeah, I, I actually think patients like this that are a candidate for our either technology or maybe a little bit longer um, conversation just because maybe she didn't know she had options. And so I might tell her very briefly still that there's the option of giving her distance and near where she can read her recipe uh, without glasses with some risk of, of glare or halos at night. And oftentimes for me, these patients say, I never drive at night. I don't go out at night. I don't really care about that risk. Um, or I'll say we can give you distance intermediate, some near, but you'll pick up a pair of readers to read a book and you won't have that risk of glare or halos at night. So it might be that I give her two options that way, but I think the biggest thing is like you said, Nicole, I give her an, an option that allows her to have independence. Whereas before maybe I would have said, oh, okay, you don't mind your glasses, good, let's just go. Right. 
Yeah, well, yeah, looks like it right looks like it was uh, it was monofocal, but there was a strong push for EDOF lenses amongst the poll. So um, I think that is probably changing a little bit. And I, I would agree with the comments that have been made. I I remember distinctly an eight a, an, an older eighty eight year old approximately patient who I kind of assumed was you know monofocal plano, and and they were happy. Great discussion uh, a few years ago, and um, and she came back. She was happy, but she said, you know, my 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 friend at my uh, at my at my nursing home you know, doesn't wear glasses. And she had, she was told about some new lenses and whatever. And, and, uh, and I, I kind of learned from that, that is at least worth discussing. And many times it's a quick discussion. The patient's like, listen, just do a simple, but at least bring it up. And I think with eat offs, I think there's a little, there's less compromise. So I think that comment is, is worthwhile. It's amazing. It's amazing how, how many uh, patients in this age group, 60s, 70s and 80s are on their smartphones, are on computers, are very computer literate. And intermediate distance becomes a, a very important thing now. So I think these comments are, are really savvy and, and worthwhile listening to. And the thing is, for me and my pay practice, sometimes they're calling back to my team after they've left, and then they talk to their neighbor and say, well, why didn't you offer this to me? And it's always more difficult for me to look back at the chart and say, well, why didn't I? You know. So if it's at all possible, I want to make sure I've noted that in the chart. Yeah, I, we actually put something in that says you are you are a candidate for a trifocal because you are not a candidate for a trifocal because. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. That's a great point. I actually tell all patients about all the lenses, even, and I'll, I'll preface it by saying, I'm going to tell you about this because you're going to hear about it from other people, but you're not a candidate for this one. And I find the interesting, I find an interesting result of this poll in that there's a lot of people who would offer this lady an eat off, and I think that speaks to our comfort level, particularly with the non-diffractive EDOFs with this photopsia profile. So uh, that's what I would also do. And so let, let's say we went ahead and gave this woman um, a, a Vividity lens and she's, she's very happy, minimal spectacle dependence. We'll go to the next slide, Ike. So of course, no good deed goes unpunished and she sends in her high-strung son. Um, and so he is a 65-year-old gentleman. He is a lawyer, he's a workaholic. A um, bit of a type A personality, as you can see there. And he is struggling with his bifocals. He is interested in spectacle freedom in all distances. And he's got, he's got mild cataracts, less than what his mother had, and a bit of a hyperopic script. And so what would we um, offer for this patient? Yeah. I Are you doing a poll here, Amandeep? Or? Yeah. Okay. All right, gang, what are we doing for this guy? I think the red flag is the type A. Um, so I, you know, this is a highly intelligent guy. He probably is the guy who's always in charge of everything. So in this case, I think uh, education, education, education. And then I just tell him what, you know, exactly as I said before, what the pluses and minuses are. And then if he chooses, he takes ownership of those pluses and minuses. So I, I, would, I would put him in charge. So Does the fact that patient is hyperopic make any difference in terms of shifting toward um, a multifocal EDOF or monofocal? Does that make does that play any role for any of you? For me, it absolutely does. Um, I think it's much easier to satisfy this patient than if he had the inverse script. Um, I mean, this is a gentleman who is hyperopic um, and presbyopic and really has. Um, is probably heavily dependent on his bifocal. So for me, offering an EDOF here would certainly be reasonable. And that's, given that that's what I gave his mother, I would feel pretty comfortable with that, but I'd have to make sure he understands that he's not going to get spectacle freedom. Yeah, I would fully agree. This is, this is the patient that scares me because you know they're gonna be extremely particular. I don't, you know, type A personality can be great if they understand what you're doing, just like what Kathy was saying. So if they understand and your counseling is appropriate, it's okay, but you need to know how much he drives at night. You need to know uh, how much he goes to sporting events and wants to see everything, or he wants to see subtitles. Does he watch for, you know, movies with subtitles? These are the things that I'm actually asking these people. Um, and really an eat off in, in this case would be uh, most appropriate as long as he understood that he could wear uh, reading glasses. I always think hyperopic patients are gonna be my happiest patients, but I just did a plus five OU. She ended up Plano with a trifocal and she's like, meh. So it, it <laughs> doesn't, always, doesn't <laughs> always turn out. Um, but, but yes, it's a lot more counseling with this type of patient, but they can be your partner in this, just like Kathy said. 
So it looks like uh, the majority did go eat off here, um, which is, I think, uh, kind of a, a safe, safer bet, I guess, than a full multifocal. Um, there's been questions about, would you think about doing a bit of micro mono? I know people use the word mini mono. Mini, let's, let's call micro like 0.5. Mini, we'll call it minus one and a half mm -hmm. and full minus 2.5. Anybody would think about for this, this, this gentleman here, you, maybe you've decided that he's too type A and too, you know, uh, personally doesn't match a multifocal, but still, you know, does a lot of reading and closer work. Would any of you kind of go for the minus half or, or even more for um, using a need off? Let, let's, let's pick a Vividi, for example, here. Yeah, I mean, that's actually how I target all my Vividis is, uh, is you know, generally the dominant eye Plano and the non-dominant eye minus a half. I, you know, before Vividi and, and now we'll see with Ihance, I, I was a mini monovision girl. So I was distance and minus one and a quarter for this type of patient. And then I would just tell them at night when they drive, they may need a pair of glasses in the car. And when they read a book, you know, pretty close at night, then they'll need a pair of readers. So, and then I say for 80% of what you do, you're not going to need glasses. So it's just important to, to kind of quantify that based on what you know about their lifestyle. Now that we have these EDOFs that are actually working um, with a low dysphotopsia profile at night, now I'm moving more towards binocular vision, you know, for distance and near. Um, where do you target your lenses? Uh, let's talk with multifocals. Um, do you target to uh, more on the myopic side a little bit or more on the hyperopic side? Or do you have any comments on that? Some people ask this question and same for Vividi and that kind of lens. Yeah, for trifocal, for panoptics, it's closest to Plano for me. And uh, for Vividi, closest to Plano and minus a half for non-dominant eye. So I was told from uh, Alcon to target on the hyperopic range. You know, so if you have a plus 0.11 and you have a minus 0 0.16, you, you go with the plus. And I don't do that. I always go to the first minus. And particularly if they have astigmatism that I'm trying to correct, it's much easier to correct on the myopic side if you have to do an enhancement or anything like that with these patients than it is to do mixed astigmatism. So that's where I am with that. So I've you know, had great results with that. Interesting, I mean, some of these multifocals, I mean, they have such a narrow peak at that, uh, at that Plano defocus that you really got to hit the mark. And that is something that, again, we probably should touch the fact that these patients are more sensitive to spherical um, imbalance or cylinder, even 0.5 diopter, some patients are sensitive to. So the hitting the refractive target is, is an important part for many, not all, for many patients. I, I tend to go closest to Plano, I'll admit, uh, considering that there's all this variability in measurements and variability in the IOL increments as well. But whatever you do, the key is to hit that target. Very important, particularly important for the uh, multifocals. Um, Amadeep, should we go to the next? Uh, I'll go back to the next. Um, yep. The next. Uh, Part here, I guess. I guess you've added a little element here. The patient is now a, a load of moderate myope here. Yeah, exactly. So we won't run a poll here, but we'll just ask our audience members or our panelists. Sorry, how does this change your discussion? So he, he's uh, a low myope now, and he probably does a lot of reading without his glasses. He's at his yeah. desk there without glasses. I think it does change it, you know. And and worse is maybe if he didn't have that cylinder too. Although that gives him a little depth of field, maybe, but. Um, you know, those patients, I like to tell them that their natural lens is a magnifier up close. And oftentimes these patients take their glasses off to read, even though they have a bifocal in their glasses. And I'll say, you know, just like that, you don't like your bifocal as much as you like taking your glasses off and you're not going to be able to take it off anymore. So I say, you know, well, and, and a lot of times a patient like that will say, well, I already have the ability to read. So let's not even talk about that. Right. And so I do tell them it's a choice, you know, wherever you see afterward is a choice. And one of the choices would be to keep you exactly the way you are now, nearsighted, where you need to have glasses for distance. But that probably isn't the choice you want. And then we move from there. Would any of you guys offer him a, a multifocal lens, whether a trifocal or um, the blended synergy lens? So I think I figured this one out just recently. This is also a really challenging patient. So I asked this patient, do you wear your glasses all the time? Do you wear your glasses when you read? And if they say, I wear my glasses all the time, 
even when they're reading, then I offer them a trifocal. I mean, I always tell them about all the technology, but just like what Kathy said, if they take their glasses off to read, I, in this patient, sometimes just offering them a minus two in both eyes, um, as long as they understand that they are going to have to wear a progressive after surgery. Um, the hardest part is exactly what Kathy said when they're like, when you're trying to discuss things and they say, but I can read now, I can read up mm -hmm. close now. And then you're like, no, but I'm changing your optics. And they're like, oh, so I think, you know, it's really important to kind of explain all the scenarios, but that question of saying, are you wearing your progressive at all times is helpful in triaging them to the right place. My favorite yeah, question is, my favorite question, my favorite question, my favorite question is, uh, sorry, is what, when do you remove your glasses to do any work? Right. And knowing that, whether it's distance or middle, that's such a key point. I'm so happy you mentioned it. Um, if we're going to do multifocal for this patient, I do think that the multifocals that give you more of a closer near point would perhaps be helpful. I, I, I just did a patient who uh, is an endodontist and, um, and you know, had, a, had, a, had an ad that was about a three ad. I won't mention the brand and uh, just wanted more, you know, one of that closer, um, you know, vision. And so actually ended up explanting that after much discussion for a continuous range um, hybrid lens that allowed for a four ad in effect to give them that 30 centimeter point. That's kind of unusual, I know, but I think these are the patients that if you're, if you're gonna do it, and I would admit I'd be shy on this one, to really be, be careful about that comfort, zo comfort zone for that near point. And I, I, it wouldn't be my first choice here, again, as we mentioned in the group, but if you've heard that this patient's always wearing their glasses, maybe there's something. But lawyer, high strong, minus two and a half, 275, I would be talk, and I always do talk patients out of it. That's what I would do here. Yeah, my preference, again, like you guys said, is to keep this guy myopic if we can. And if we can't, I really would try to go for uh, good, like the, the best near vision that we can with a presbyopic IOL. So certainly he, he would need something like a panoptics or synergy. But then we get to this next slide. And this is his, his um, uh, placido disc image, as well as his um, slit lamp photo. So he's got some EBMD. So what are we going to do for this guy now? Again, you know, at this point for these patients, I, I've had these patients before and I say, look, you know, if you're going to try to have something that's really going to give you the best chance to be independent of glasses for distance and near, your ocular surface needs to be improved. And that's a longer pathway. It's going to, you know, take a while to heal and be stable if we decide to do that. And they have to be highly motivated. And I tell them, you know, that's, that's a different pathway than most patients. So that if we're going to really go that pathway to be as independent as possible, that's what I would say. Again, this guy though might do well with just, you know, giving him some near vision like he has now and letting him wear distance glasses. Yeah, these are, are very challenging uh, cases here. Um, when, when you have a patient with epithelial basement membrane dystrophy or Salzman's nodules, and they are expecting, you know, at any distance, a spectacle independence, I, I perform a superficial keratectomy um, in the office. Um, I go all the way out to a millimeter. I don't just do one zone because then it just comes back. It's actually a degeneration rather than a dystrophy. Uh, because if you do it properly, it typically doesn't come back. Um, and it's, it's one of those heartbreaks where you're like, oh, you're not going to be like your friends. You know, this is going to take longer for you. And I wait eight weeks before I do a, a recalc, because if you go too fast, um, you can really have some uh, different measurements, particularly if they have astigmatism. And then intraoperatively, um, I use, you know, methylcellulose on the ocular surface during the case. And then I do, I put on a bandage contact lens um, after so that there's no issues overnight with that epithelium that hasn't, you know, fully tacked down like one that's been there for years. I think this highlights, you know, that, and, and I know it's difficult because, you know, getting all these technologies for patients is not always easily accessible. There are costs involved, depending on what healthcare system you work and access topography isn't always available and, and it isn't something you can easily do. Uh, same thing with macro CTs in some places as well. And so, but you know, a clinical exam though is, is so critical. And I think we often gloss over the cornea. I realized that the, uh, you know, in my, in my book, of course, Shem's canal is made way more important than the cornea, but I will say for IOLs that it's important to look at the cornea and you can see subtle changes that are important. And the topography really brings it out though. And I think that's where the value of topography 
whether it's looking at ocular surface or whether it's looking at uh, you know corneal anterior corneal issues like this uh, can be helpful. And and as you said, I mean this patient, you know some people may have put in a toric lens for this patient, right? They go, oh the topography shows two dot. My worst, my my favorite thing to criticize people is when they look at a topography and they look at the uh, automated uh, keratometry and they look at the stigmatism two diopters and okay the patient needs a toric lens, right? And first of all that's not always true. Uh, with the interpolation of a, of a, of a topography. Second, secondly, obviously correlation to other measurements are important, including glasses, but the topography here really shows it nicely here. Um, and, and again, as Isma said, the floor scene, as we saw, as, as was shown in the picture there. And you can see after PTK and superficial K that the, you know, the cornea is not great yet, but it certainly um, looks more regular. And the stigmatism, you can see the difference here on the topography on the, um, on the Ks. And so, um, I think that's important. I have a series of case, cases where it's exactly what we've done. Now, the question becomes, and I think Amadi, I don't know if you're going to ask the question is, would you, you've, you're better here, but is this good enough still to go for multifocal or an EDOF, or would you still stick to a monofocal in this patient? So for me personally, it's not good enough yet. Um, and get, given the fact that we need a perfect ocular surface for a multifocal lens, I'm not particularly happy with that surface. Um, and for me, I don't think an EDOF is going to give him the near that he's used to. And so in my hands, I'd probably try to nudge him towards monofocals and remaining myopic. Well, we also need placido imaging. Um, I, you know, I never understand how people can evaluate the ocular surface mm -hmm. without having placido imaging. So I think you got to find some technology in your office that will do this. And I also really want repeat measurements on these patients because like you said, Nicole, it takes a long time really to get stability. And I don't give them a time frame except to say it's going to be a couple months or maybe more, you know? Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. This is, this is not uncommon, folks. Um, when you look at patients' corneas, uh, you do find epithelial changes and ocular surface issues. And topographies are all over the place. Um, here in Canada, we are challenged, though, because, you know, topography is not a routine measurement to do for patients. Um, and many practices don't, or if there are, then there's additional cost involved and access is a problem. So it is a real issue. And again, it goes to the counseling though, no matter what, that, um, that there are obviously going to be some variations in results. And, you know, the more information we have, the better. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a struggle I still find sometimes. I mean, we'd like to be able to do everything on a patient, right? All the imaging, everything front and back and aberration and all the rest of it. The reality is that it's probably wasting money, wasting resources and, and overkill. And also as patients are spending more necessarily. So, but at the same time, a patient who's demanding, or I shouldn't say demanding, but expects to have a certain level, maybe there needs to be an opportunity to do that. I don't have a full answer on that. I don't know. I'm going to bring in Sharif for that question because it's a, it's a chair's question about, uh, you know, these kind of cases highlight where technology can help, but yet, you know, how do we find that balance? Any, any comments from you? I'm not touching that, Ike. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I have to, I have to uh, let the chair's uh, prerogative sit, insist here, but that, those, are, those are the points to think about here with, with those questions. And, I, and I, I put them out there because it's not a simple, let's just do it and don't think about it. There are real life everyday questions for our patients. Um, okay, I'm gonna, let's move to our next case. And again, these are, these are you know, cases to bring out. I know people have questions and we're going to bring out some of these questions during these cases. So I'm going to Okay, so we'll go through this one more quickly so the the previous lawyer is happy he sends in the senior partner from his firm this guy's not working as much as he used to he's settling into retirement working less um, doesn't really drive much plays a lot of golf um, and he's struggling with his glasses so he's got cataracts that are limiting his vision but he's also struggling with his glasses he would like to continue to read without the glasses but he also wants to see his golf ball clearly and so as a, as a poll is going on, I'll ask the panelists, what would you offer this patient? Maybe we'll start with Kathy. Yeah, I mean, so this is the guy who has the super magnifier near vision, um, likes reading without glasses. I mean, I don't, so he does wanna be spectacle independent. I mean, it, this is all about uh, um, education. So he can't have everything. He can't have a super magnifier near vision um, and not have any other compromise. So the beginning of my conversation with a guy like this is all of our choices are a compromise. And usually I say everything after 40 is a compromise and people <laughs> agree with that. So, um, and then I just described the compromises. So for him, 
I think this is a great uh, choice for a EDOF and just with the recognition that with the first eye, we'll see how you're doing. With your second eye, we might do a little micro mono, monovision. Maybe we'll hit where you're not as dependent on your glasses um, to read or you'll be reading maybe with a larger font on a e-reader type situation, but it will allow you that range of vision and decreased dysphotopsias for golf. Yeah, this patient is the perfect patient to ask if he has his glasses on all the time. And if he does, he's getting a trifocal uh, as long as he meets all the other criteria um, or an eat off would be great. But leaving him with nothing in the intermediate would be difficult. And trying monovision at this age, I don't know if, if you'd have to do true monovision. So I'm not sure if that would work well. It's also difficult to know with the monovision given the, the cataract. density of his cataracts. And exactly. I, I wish everyone in their 40s would just do a monovision trial with their optometrist <laughs> right. and just come in with a report um, when they had their cataract come on. And so I can we go to the next N slide. N Nicole, you, that's what, Nicole, you mentioned that you're, earlier you were doing monovision. Would you do monovision or mini monovision on someone who's never had it? Would you just kind of just do it empirically or would so you always want a trial? Yeah, so this is really interesting. So if their cataract is, is, you know, at a point where I can't try it anymore, I would do, most people say, if you're doing monovision, do the near eye first, you can see how the lens sits in the eye, and then we're going to go distance. In a, in a naive patient, who I want to maybe have the opportunity to do mini monovision, I would never do full monovision on someone who's never tried it with contacts or LASIK. I will start with the distance eye to make sure I nail my target. Um, so the dominant eye. Um, and so I want to make sure I nail my target. And then in the other eye, if their, you know, vision is 20, 30 or better, I do a mini monovision trial in the office with contact lenses to see if they can tolerate it. Um, and that was how I was doing a lot of these patients that wanted more spectacle independence, but didn't qualify for multifocal. Sometimes okay. in these patients with, you know, a low amount of myopia or around the minus two, one, two, even a little bit more what you can do if they're not too bad and their non-dominant eye is, you know, do their, their first eye, hit the target for distance and then say, how are you doing? You know, right. if they're saying, I'm still kind of reading, I don't think it's a big deal. I like this, then, you know, you can replicate it then. So I think that's sort of a inter, you know, eye uh, monovision trial. I so let's do the, let's just get into this situation now. So the same patient and this patient is like great personality. You know, he's very motivated for a multifocal of your choice. Um, you know, he's wearing glasses, uh, but that takes him off for, takes him off for reading, but his, his near focus is up here and he's happy with what you told him about multifocal. So he's, he's like happy with it. Um, but you know, you also find out he has glaucoma now, you know, I, I know some of my cornea colleagues will probably forget this, but yes, glaucoma still does happen. Um, and so <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, so man. this patient had glaucoma for 10 years though, and is on one med and the fields are stable. And those are the fields here. Um, what, uh, what is, what are your thoughts here? Are you still staying with multivocal? Would you switch to something else based on this? So, I mean, for me, I don't want to split light in, in his affected eye here. So I would rather, I think this is a potential since everything's been stable for 10 years and you know, it seems like it's a guy who's not progressing and very compliant. Um, there's a potential to put a multifocal um, in the left eye and then put in something like a vividity or a monofocal in the right eye. So this is where I would be really curious from my uh, international colleagues to find out how IHANS is doing because if it really doesn't cut down on the contrast sensitivity, I would love to do a mini monovision, but like distance to minus 150 um, on this patient and really see if um, that eye hands in, in the non-dominant eye would, would bring it in. And then if we really don't lose contrast, because that's what we're worried about, right? So we're worried about losing contrast in these glaucoma patients. Uh, that would be something I would be really interested in. And I just don't have the answer yet. So I'm doing my first eye hands, you know, next week. Tim, Tim Hilson just mentioned guys like this love to have distance vision. It makes them feel young or something. <laughs> Tim, Tim from up North. Tim, Tim's, one, Tim's one of our, uh, our, was an ophthalmologist in Ontario. Great, great point. It's good to know what makes people feel young. Um, so I have a question for the audience or for the panelists here with this particular situation. I know we're not offering him a multifocal, but if we're going with, let's say, an eye hands or a vividity, 
and we, whether the micro monovision or the, or the mini monovision, um, how do you feel about switching dominance? Because his, his, his right eye has the more um, advanced field loss. And let's just say he's right eye dominant. W would you feel comfortable switching dominance for this patient? I, you know, there's, there's believers and there's non-believers. <laughs> And so it really has to do with your, if you're a believer in dominance as an issue, if you do a 10 two and really see what's happening in, in the central vision, it may help guide you uh, what direction to go in with this patient. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, this is actually a real case of mine. Um, and I did switch the dominance with absolutely no issues. And um, I, I have found some papers from, and I can reference this afterwards, but it seems, I mean, I, I, I don't advocate for this. I absolutely like to keep the dominance as is, but there is evidence to suggest that switching dominance is not as uh, deleterious as, as we fear sometimes. And so I, ha I have done that in, in situations like this um, and making the dominant eye the, the slightly myopic. So, uh, although in this individual MND, his central vision was, or his central field was good and he's been stable, yes. right? Yeah, so the reason I switched to dominance was because, because he actually ended up with uh, monofocals with a bit of monovision, um, but I just wanted him to have the left field for driving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'll make a comment in that the problem, in my opinion, is that, that dominance is not always the same. Some people have a very strong dominant eye and, and other people have, have a weakly dominant eye. And so yeah. that's the challenge to kind of, it's almost like you want to gauge how dominant or how dominant that patient is with their eye. Of course, I think we've seen cataracts can change things or someone has a, you know, uh, loss of vision and, and one can become switcher dominance, but it's always a tough one. Um, and I think, uh, oh, actually, actually Steve Stafford just, just typed this in as I'm talking here. So it's nice <laughs> yeah. to be on the same page as Steve here. Um, and I think that's important as just as Steve said, if the, if the patient has a really strong dominant eye, then I think it's important. But not as dominant, I think it doesn't matter. And studies don't always capture that um, as far as that issue. So I, I still like to do the dominant dominance thing. And I try to get some idea. Of course, a very obvious one would be someone who has an, uh, an amblyopic eye or someone who has uh, uh, a, a deviation. That would be more an extreme dominant situation. Mm -hmm. But there are other ways where patients still have binocular fusion and still have a dominant, strongly dominant. So I'll just add that point. Um, you know, this visual field is moderate and, and, and this patient will have some contrast loss from their glaucoma. I, although multifocal lenses, modern day multifocal lenses don't reduce contrast like the old ones do, they still do. Um, I would be comfortable with an EDOF lens. I, I would still prefer to, to, be, to maintain dominance. And this is where, if you want to be really safe, and Nicole, just to answer your question, I, I feel very comfortable that the eye hands has a contrast sensitivity of a Technus one piece. I feel very comfortable with that. In my experience, and the studies, and again, I know it's been a year here, but I, that's my feeling. And despite what Amadi said, I do think the dysphotopsy profile is really similar. Um, there's gonna be obviously patients who are gonna have dysphotopsy, but that could have been a monofocal as well. So I feel like that's a, that's a no brainer to do a, an eye hands. And anybody you think about a monofocal, I'll put it out there uh, in my own impression, I could change my mind in six months, who knows. A vividity is, is interesting because the video will give you more, will give you more for, for functional near. Um, and I'd be tempted here but you know there is some contrast loss. I mean, the question is whether it's clinically significant or not, and that question is still out there, as kind of Nicole said. And so I think if you were a risk taker and the patient was a bit more, you could maybe push the envelope for vividity. But if you want to be safe, I think uh, I think the eye hands would probably be be the safer one in this particular case. Although you said the glaucoma is stable, which is which is good. And by the way, you know if if there are more meds, consider perhaps to do something more like a like a mixed procedure. I got to put that in there. Sorry, that was. Uh, that was probably inappropriate to say in a cataract meeting, but okay, let's go to our next. There's, uh, there's, there's a very good question in the, uh, in the chat about uh, determining strong versus weak dominance, especially in a patient that has cataracts and these cataracts are asymmetric and the vision is asymmetric often. Um, what do you do practically? You know, as I was reading that, I was wondering, you know, I wonder if you asking a patient if they know if they're dominant in one eye or not, is some indication. So that if you're very one eye dominant, you may actually know that. And if people have no idea what you're talking about, they may have a strong preference or not and not know it, but maybe just the idea that they know they're a dominant in one eye is some sort of dividing you know, question for them. Uh, when I have them check, I always do it myself. I don't trust anybody else to do it. 
uh, I will ask, you know, I will cover the eye on, you know, one side and say, sorry, both eyes look in the center, get in the center of your little diamond. Then I cover myself the other eye and I say, is it still in the middle? They say, yes. And then I cover the other eye and they say, it, I say, is it still in the middle? No. Can you see it at all? No. That is a lot of, you know, dominance in the other eye. If you say, yeah, it's just shifted a little bit, you know, this is not precise science here, but this is kind of, you know, how you can check it in the lane. Yeah, I, I think the problem, the cataract is the issue. If someone, if you test any of us, I know, I'm sure no one here is a cataract, um, you know, I think you can do it by fogging, right? You can basically start fogging the one eye and see when does the patient start saying that their vision is, is, is blurry. And if you, if you, if you can fog them a lot, in the in a non-dominant eye and they're still saying hey everything looks great then you can argue that patient has a very strong dominant right eye for example if i'm fogging my left eye i'm good plus one plus two plus three and i'm still not saying there's a problem hey everything looks great but um but i think that that kind of gives you a bit of a sense that they're strongly dominant i think that's one thing you can do but i think in a cataract situation i think it's really challenging to be able to you know to, to do that in a compromised visual system and that's again the, the challenge i have is then i don't know whether this patient's going to have an issue um, and this pertains to all kinds of things, for example, even mixing and matching, and I won't get into that, but that's one reason why I'm a little bit careful with that, with that question. Right. That's why the shift, you know, they can kind of, it's like a gross. The amount too. Yeah. Right. That's good. Yeah. Those are all good pearls. Um, good questions. Okay. So I mean, should we go to the next, uh, variation on this one here? This is a, this is a different scenario, but our same scenario, but the patient has less severe glaucoma. So the visual field is is less severe, although although the left eye, I'm not totally happy with that inferior defect, but let's just say it's a milder case. Um, and you have some, you know, you have 10 years of, uh, almost 10 years of, of RNFL analysis to show that the RNFL has been stable. Pressure stable, everything else mild. Does anything change on this one? Would you, would anyone do a multifocal here perhaps? I know multifocal was a question in the last one. Is it the poll question, Amity? We don't remember. No, it's not. This is just okay. for the panelists. I stand by my decision. <laughs> so, I mean, the question is, and I think Steve Safran was, was commenting on this. Hi, Steve. Um, the question is, how much do you have to offset the other eye? You know, in the, the published literature that's out there that was recently in JCRS, they're getting about one line of improvement. And so can you do distance, you know, in the dominant eye and in the other eye, uh, just do like a minus 75 and really get even more depth of focus? And that's that's really... Uh, what would be interesting, or in this patient versus the other, can you do more? Uh, but it's minimal mono vision for this patient. And there's also neutral asphericity lenses with some, you know, mini or micro mono might also give them some depth of field. Yeah, I, I mean, my general, like I think, you know, we've mentioned here that uh, for my go to for when I'm doing an eat off lens is typically to do a bit of. Uh, micro like 0.5 but I've had a few patients who really really want that uh, near but they are absolutely aghast at, at halos and glare and they're and they're otherwise you know otherwise you know healthy and, and and good as far as I know and they're not crazy you know that one I've kind of pushed the limits a bit and gone about 0.75 you know and I think when you do that you'd really get uh, a good j1 um, and and yes you know you perhaps risk a little bit of asymmetry but they're more like overlapping focus zones not focus points and so I feel that issues of uh, asymmetry or anisometropia symptoms are, are less. Of course, if a patient has, you know, is going to be covering their eye and comparing it, it could be an issue, but I push the limit. But I, my routine for, for Vividi is, is about 0.5 and 0.7 for people who want to push it. For eye hands, it's similar to that, although you don't get as much near, but you get something more. That's kind of what I've been doing now, at least in my own personal experience. With your glaucoma patients? Yeah, I mean, whether it's glaucoma or not. I mean, when I'm doing an eat-off in general, that's what that's what I've been doing. You know, one thing I will say is that in in experimenting with different amounts of near with vividity, that you do sort of start losing some, even in their distance vision and and their corrected vision almost at a minus one or more. So I would say, just as you did, Ike, that minus seventy-five is sort of the upper limit for me. For sure. So I mean. What if this patient has pseudoesfoliation, let's say, in, or just, just a general question that came up earlier. Um, do, does anybody use multifocal lenses in pseudoesfoliation? Again, no glaucoma, everything's fine, great personality, good refractive error, everything else. There's nothing else you find, but they have pseudoesfoliation. Is this no, a contraindication I, of multifocals? 
I think there's not like pseudo exfoliation is different for different people. So sometimes you have a lot of laxity and sometimes you have almost nothing. It seems like very strong zonules. I think in those cases, I, I do like to put a CTR in just to give them some added benefit. And I tell them don't rub their eye. So I think that makes a big difference too in the future. So I'm not, it's not an absolute contraindication for me. So uh, the late Alan Crandall showed that um, in these eyes, even if you put a CTR, they're going to move over time. It's typically eight years. Maybe our polishing of the anterior capsule will decrease biomosis and decrease our chances of um, issues later on. But these patients need to be counseled that the IOL may move over time. If you know how to refixate it and you know how to get it perfectly centered, then I would say, sure, 100%. If you do not know how to do that, I'm probably sticking with, you know, kind of like an EDOF or an IHANS with mini mono is probably the best way. So the question is, um, is an EDOF, let's, let's take Vividi, for example, right. less sensitive to decentration and tilt than a classical multifocal? We it don't definitely know. is. No, there's actually, there's bench data. Yeah, that shows okay. that. yeah, yeah. And it shows that it's very um, tolerant of decentration and tilt. It appears to be on bench, and and again, it's a small amount. I think it's like I think it's like five degrees and and less than a millimeter. So I think there might be something to it, but I think that's, as Kathy said, I think there's some bench data on that. Um, eye hands, you wonder as well. I don't know if I know any data on that, but probably more, probably less sensitive. But what about just in general? Like we know, negative spherical aberration lenses when they tilt and decenter, they're more likely to cause coma than an aspherically neutral lens. And I'll be honest with you, my choice for a pseudoexfoliation patient in general is to use an aspherically neutral lens because when that lens tilts or decenters, there's less chance of creating more higher aberration. Of course, if the patient's pupil is small, it may not be an issue. Um, and many patients who do pseudoex have a small pupil, you have to remember aperture is important to consider when you think of aberration. Um, and in general, I would say that I, I have gotten away with it, I guess, in some cases for putting a, uh, a multifocal, but I probably, I feel a bit more comfortable putting an eat off. Um, it's so hard to predict who's going to decenter. And as Nicole said, we have some pretty clever ways to recenter lenses by lassoing um, the lens. Having a CTR in doesn't prevent it from happening, from occurring. The zonular weakness is progressive. This is a lytic problem, pretty lytic problem. But it does provide a bit of a backbone to suture to that can enhance the centration of a lens with two or three loops around the CTR. So I do like that idea. And I do think the idea of capsule polishing, the anterior capsule can reduce some of the phimosis as Nicole said. So uh, I, I'm a little bit shy on that one, but I, I will say we've picked in some patients where uh, you know, we feel we could get away with it, but we don't know the answer to that fully. Right. Just another pearl on that, Ike, is that you know, if you have a pseudo exfoliation, doesn't dilate well, shallow chamber indicating you know, some zonulopathy of everything pushing forward, that's a clue to not use a trifocal in that patient mm -hmm. or you know, and so there's, you know, just like Kathy said, there's different degrees of pseudo exfoliation. Also age of the patient, um, you know, matters. Absolutely. All, all great pearls. Um, okay. So let's, let's continue moving, moving along here. I'm a deep, and I'm just looking at the chat group here. And we'll try to get some of the questions here a lot. Sure. So, I mean, the last patient's happy and he brings to you his buddy who's his, actually his limo driver, his confidant, his golf buddy. Um, and so he's the driver for the previous patient and he's struggling to drive. He's got 20, 40 cataracts. Um, he, he does want to be able to see the GPS while he's driving um, and already is symptomatic of nighttime halos. He's got a low myopic um, script preoperatively. And I guess the question for the, the audience as well as the panelists is what are you offering this patient? So it so sounds like this patient is, has cataracts, cortical ones that are causing halos already, right? So, and the audience is voting. What do you guys think? Nicole, would you uh, consider anything more other than a monofocal and be safe or would you consider something presbyopic here? Well, I think this touches on the point of discussing what the patient does all day. Um, taking a patient and who's mainly complaining of nighttime symptoms and then giving them nighttime symptoms is not typically uh, a practice builder. So in this case, I would probably go towards a, an EDOF um, that is gonna give us you know, some range, right? He needs to see his dashboard, he needs to see his GPS, but he does, you know, we you just explained to the patient that they'll need reading glasses for super near work. 
Um, and I think that would be great. Yeah, I yeah, and I totally love this guy's preoperative prescription. He's a myope, but he's not a right. he's a, he's a very low myope. So I think uh, um, an EDOF yeah. lens would do very great in terms of replicating any intermediate vision that he has at present, while also improving his distance uh, uncorrected vision. Yeah, and getting rid of the halos because that's really a big problem for him. So it kind of hits all the points he wants: distance and intermediate, no halos. So this is uh, this is this is another one that's not too different here. Um, uh, this is this is a real patient again here. Uh, could have been ophthalmologist even, but a 58 year old male long haul truck driver who reads romantic novels on his iPad and makes TikTok videos on his phone. Like seriously, this is this is actually Dr. Rai's patient. He gets these kind of patients. Every other patient, right? Yes, <laughs> he's very symptomatic from PSC cataracts, and you can see he's got uh, you know um, uh, somewhat lightly myopic prescription with some cylinder. Um, you can see his, um, his biometry here. Um, I'll just point out the uh, total keratometry here. He's got some against the rule cylinder in the right and left eye, average axial length, average AC depth, lens thickness, a little bit thinner than the average cataract. Not surprisingly, he's 58 with the PSC um, and a bit more cylinder in the right and left eye. This is his, his right eye. You can see the cylinder looks regular, but it's asymmetric. And again, it's consistent with against the rule. Um, we look at the Zernike um, polynomial, the wavefront, there is some significant coma, not surprisingly, considering the asymmetrical uh, cylinder on the cornea as well. Circular aberration is not that much. Um, left eye is, uh, is, let's say, you know, somewhat similar, a um, bit of a usual topography, probably some artifact and some ocular surface there. But let's just say in general, the issue is this patient has a bit of uh, asymmetrical cylinder and coma. He's motivated. Um, he's just concerned about night vision, though. He's a, he's a long haul truck driver and already has some, some issues at nighttime. Um, topography shows asymmetrical astigmatism and, uh, and increased HOAs. And he's got a pupil size that is a bit larger than perhaps some of our older patients. I don't know. I'd be interested to hear about how some of you look or don't look at pupil size and HOAs in lens selection. So, thoughts on this patient? Well, I think the nice thing about this patient is he's already using a reader. So, you know, if you're using an e-reader, you're, you're a good intermediate vision candidate because you can increase the font size and still be pretty comfortable. Um, TikTok, I don't know. I've never made a TikTok video, so I'm not sure how much near vision you need for that. Um, not much, not much. Oh, good, good. So, and clearly the big issue is not having glare and halos at night when he's driving with his larger than average pupils. So I think that again, a lot of the same options we've been giving some of the other patients are appropriate here. Um, but I'd be comfortable with the non-diffractive EDUF or, or maybe a monovision plus type solution for this patient. Maybe a tiny bit of micro mono. Yeah, I would uh, fully agree. I, you know, to the point of a monovision plus or anytime you disassociate the eyes, you need to explain to them at night when you drive, you know, if you're above a minus, you know, 50, at night when you drive, you may need glasses. Um, this is a truck driver, he's not gonna wanna hear that. So I fully agree with something that does distance and intermediate um, with the least side effect profile at night. I mean, for me personally, one of the other concerns I have with this patient is especially that left sill. Um, and so, I mean, I would love to see him lubricate and return to see if we can get some regularity on his, on his topography. Uh, and coma really bothers me as well. And so sometimes um, in these cases, what I really like is a, uh, the, the Invista lens, which is neutral from a spherical aberration standpoint. And so it, it plays well with uh, some of the coma and may actually provide a little bit of depth um, anyway. So th that's one of my concerns. I'd probably bring this guy back with some lubrication. The other thing to that point, I think if you go back to his IOL calcs, there was a big difference between the power. Uh, in between the eyes. And when you see something like that, you want to make sure that you're going to um, go back and, and redo the case. Um, so when there's a big difference and you can justify it with axial length, you know, or you can justify it with uh, the case, then that's, that's good. But if you really can't justify it and you have, you know, one of those artifact topographies, I think that's an amazing point. Yeah, great point. Uh, and there is some excellent difference, although it doesn't explain everything. Some of it is from his case. And I think the point about 
uh, about uh, repeating is important. I just, my only point to Amadeep, I just be careful with your language, uh, telling the truck driver to lubricate and return. I just would be mindful of the, <laughs> of the terminology. Like romantic, yeah. romantic novels, you know. That's yeah. The other thing. You know, I, I, I submitted this case, and I'm, I'm almost wondering if it's actually him that it, <laughs> with the TikTok videos and the romantic I thought novels. It was I, think Steve. I thought it was Steve. <laughs> it could be. It, it actually was. It actually is actually Steve Saffron. Actually, and he does drive. He does drive trucks. Although, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, the. Yeah, um, I, I just want to make one other point. Is yeah. that Sometimes I come up with this. You know, we've had a long talk. We've talked about everything positive, negative about a choice. Come up with a choice, and then remember, like for instance, Vividi has a limited range of power mm -hmm. right now, and sometimes yeah, he's right on the edge of the astigmatism that's covered by Vividi and. Not that you couldn't do it and do an enhancement if you needed to, but be aware that, you know, if you're coming up with this long thought out process and then the, the lens isn't available, that's kind of a downer. So Yeah, so that's awesome, Kathy. Mm -hmm. I always say to them, this is a lens that I would choose for you. We need to do your measurements to make sure that you're a candidate. So yes, great point. Absolutely. And the other good point is to make sure it's available for the second eye, because I've heard of people implanting a Vivi in the first eye and then realizing that it's not available in the power or the torx correction that they need for the second eye. So make sure you plan that ahead of time. Yes. Um, and so I just want to just add that um, this patient did end up having eat off lens. They did fairly well. And again, the classical option is to do a bit of micro mono um, and explain that. And uh, the patient actually ended up doing, doing fairly well. Um, let me get to uh, our next uh, our next case here. And I just realized I just lost my cursor here. Uh, before, as I'm trying to find my cursor here, question that came up here, from a glaucoma specialist, Rob Scherzer, just to kind of cut through the hype. Is there a difference in the range of vision and intermediate and near vision uh, and aberration between synergy and panoptics? Um, I know that Kathy and Nicole haven't used synergy yet. I don't think you have yet, yeah. but Amandeep, Sharif, I don't know if you had any experience with uh, synergy. Yeah, I do. So, I mean, one of the hard, it's difficult to answer that question because the experience with the synergy is uh, limited. We've had the panoptics for a while in Canada, but the synergy is relatively new. And the other limiting factor with the synergy is the lack of toric options. So to, in, right now to implant a synergy lens, you basically need to find a patient with low sill in both eyes, who is an otherwise good candidate. Um, and so once you, once you can find a few of those, having implanted it, I will say that my anecdotal limited experience is that the synergy may have a, a closer near point than the panoptics, but I do wonder if it has a bit more of, um, of halo and glare than the panoptics. Although again, it's only when you sort of dig for it. I, I have, I mean, I've had happy patients for the most part with both uh, of these lenses with good patient selection. Yeah, I was, I was think I would say Rob, the near point I think is, is better. I, and I've tested it out on people on patients to kind of just test out their near point. For many patients, it's not an issue, but I think if you want to really push that near point, um, that four ad does help to get that 30, 36 centimeter near point as opposed to more of a 40, which is more of a panoptics. Again, probably not a major issue for many patients. The low contrast vision, hard to assess. Again, theoretically, there may be some benefit um, on the synergy, but hard to prove that. So it's becoming harder to prove differences, to be honest with you. And the marketing, of course, is immense with these technologies. And shifting out the marketing versus reality is very difficult. Um, but it's also good in the sense that these lenses technologies are all quite good in the sense of what they perform and they all have their own weaknesses, which are not too different. Um, and I think people are going to be comfortable with what they have in their own personal experience and their comfort material and, and delivery approaches as mentioned. And then the optics and the basic science would be important as well. So um, let's go. Should we go to our next question? Yeah, let's do it. And whoever JW is, JW is asking us all, what kind of lens would you put in your own patient? Um, in your own eye. We're going we're gonna to ask the, answer that question at the end, though. That's why I just, that's why I told JW that. Um, let's go to, uh, so we don't, have to, we don't have to answer that right away. Let's, uh, let's go to our next case here. Um, I'll let Amadeep, I think, do this one. Yeah, so Amadeep? absolutely. So, yeah. so here's a very common case that we get um, these days. The, the cataract age group, that's cataract cohort that's coming in now um, has had, uh, LASIK in the past very often. So we got a 65 year old woman. She's got moderate cataracts. Her LASIK center is no longer around. So records are unavailable, but she did enjoy her post LASIK vision. And at this point she's retired, she's traveling. She's interested in some presbyopic correction. And you can see that she's got 2040 cataracts with uh, a little bit of myopia. 
And so uh, we'll ask the audience, or sorry, we'll ask the panelists first, there's no poll yet. We'll ask the panelists, what's your, what is your go-to plan here for some presbyopic correction in a post-LASIK eye, myopic LASIK? So we see this a lot these days, a lot of LASIK patients out there who uh, now have cataract or early cataract and want to want the cataract out and they also have paid to get uh, spectacle freedom. So they want spectacle freedom after the cataract too. And they're from, and they're from LA. So, you know, they're really high demanding. It's really so bad. Nicole, you see this a lot. Uh, this is, yeah. So, okay. So the first question is, is did they do any mini, mini monovision? How old were they when they had their LASIK? Second question is I need to see some sort of topography and wavefront analysis, but you're not giving me that yet. Um, these patients typically in the past, they were mini monovision patients. Um, I'd make sure I nail my distance target and then work on the other eye for a minus 150 max. That was my strategy. Uh, now we have incorporated the light adjustable lens technology into our practice and what we, you know, it's, it's really performing well. I only do it on post LASIK um, and post RK and monovision naive people that um, are not candidates for an EDOF. So that's kind of my thought process. So with the light adjustable, even, you know, even though you do one eye on a Tuesday, the other eye on a Thursday, you bring them back at the same time all the time, we start correcting at about three weeks. Um, and then uh, we can play around with micro mono and mini mono. And there is some sort of EDOF quality to it where they're a, if I do Plano on one eye and a minus 75 on the other, they're able to read and see 20, 25 in the eye that's offset. Great, great points. I'm, I'm gonna, I think, I think uh, we should share the, um, the uh, topography and that Nicole, Nicole was asking. Exactly, Nicole made a very astute comment. She wanted to see this before she committed to anything. And here you go. And we'll, we'll launch an audience poll as well while Nicole and Kathy can uh, give us her thoughts. So let's go back one slide. Yep, there you go. So this patient had LASIK a long time ago. It looks like a very small optical zone um, in their right eye too. So maybe a little bit of irregularity around their central visual axis in their left eye. And, you know, I think something that's a little bit uh, more tolerant of those type of issues, I like the idea of putting in neutral aspherosity lens and doing some mini mono, not micro mono with this patient. Um, that's a nice idea. I think um, light adjusted lens is awesome as an idea as well. And so, you know, I, I don't have that unfortunately yet, but hopefully in the future. The other thing to notice is that these are really flat cornea. So Kathy brings up a really good point that this was done a long time ago or a, a very aggressive um, <laughs> LASIK. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, the left eye looks decentered. I love the placido overlay over this. I just need to know how to do this. I love this. Um, and, you know, this is a patient that we've done enough light adjustable with um, uh, these types of patients, even some slightly decentered ablations that do pretty well. The caveat in RK, um, just as a side note, is that if they don't have regular placido imaging, you cannot promise them anything because once you take away the lens and then you're left with the cornea, they still may need to know that their best corrected vision will be with a contact lens. And that is something that I've gotten myself in trouble with where you overpromise the technology. And then at the end of the day, it's their cornea that's causing a lot of the aberration. So I've implemented the eye trace. You can do a Marco 3D wave where you can get some sort of separation of the cornea from the internal aberrations and then give a better idea of what type of lens. Um, I shy away from trifocal technology or diffractive technology in these patients. And I don't have experience with the eye hands yet, um, as I said, but this could be, if it really is no harm, no foul, this could be an even better choice for a patient like this. Somebody asked a question about, is there EDOF properties with a light adjusted lens? And there is a little bit of a change that's made in spherical aberration as you're adjusting maybe a near um, target with the light adjusted lens, it gives them a little bit more depth of field. So right. that's also a benefit, I think. Yeah, so you target them a bit hyperopic and then you build it in. And, you know, the light adjustable net, you didn't catch on in, in Europe or internationally 
uh, because at the time when it was implemented, they didn't have cylinder correction. So you didn't have, you know, this amazing technology at that point, and now it's changed. Great. Um, the, the, the looks like a pretty even split between Monovision and EDOF. So uh, you can see that people are, are there's a segment of population that are pretty comfortable with EDOFs in these aberrated corneas and comorbidities. And, and I think that is an interesting phenomenon, not surprising. That's kind of where a lot of the hype has been, admittedly, from many. Um, Nicole makes valid points about still needing more evidence, but um, it, is, it is certainly a potential opportunity, I guess, in that sense. And what, that's what we're seeing with the audience as well. There was a point they made about aura. Anybody using intraoperative aberrometry, particularly in these cases uh, with post-LASIK eyes? Absolutely. Um, so there's a, there's a paper uh, coming out comparing aura to Barrett Truquet, uh, which shows a slight improvement over aura. Obviously you have to have um, an excellent surface. The, the newest uh, formula that I'm using is the Barrett Truquet TK. And that's where you're using the posterior cornea uh, to help decide uh, the power of the lens. Uh, it's, so it's a different formula. It's on the Iowa Master 700, but you can plug in um, on uh, the, in the actual Barrett Truque formula. formula. You, you click on measured PCA and you can put in a Pentacam or, or a Galilei or anything that gives you what they call it the PK1 and PK2, posterior cornea one, posterior cornea two. And we've been comparing this to Barrett Truque and it's about a 7% improvement. I realize that we're even with the Barrett Truquet, we're only about 70% within a half a diopter. So that's not 93% where we are with, you know, the Barrett, using the Barrett or the Hill RBF with a, with a naive cornea. So the Barrett Truquet TK, where you're using posterior cornea, uh, really may take us the next level. Yeah, I, I would echo that, echo that my experience as well. Um, just some random questions that have come up. Um, how much? Do, how much do you can to take into account? I should say coma and coronal HOAs in excluding patients from multifocal lenses. And I'll add the second part to that will be angle kappa. I mean, I think it's important to look at these things and to consider it, um, especially if you have a patient where you're worried about the quality of the cornea, or if they're post refractive for sure. Um, I think it's important. What do you think, Nicole? Yeah, you know, it, I, I, you know, I've done a lot of lit reviews on this, and it's like you can find just mm -hmm. as many papers yeah. saying angle cap and coma matters. It doesn't matter. Angle cap is the only one that matter. Coma is the only one that matters. What I do is I look for a, a well-centered ablation. I look for a cornea. If the cornea looks normal, I will con after LASIK, I will consider a trifocal or EDUF technology. If the cornea looks abnormal with a decentered ablation, I will shy away from it. If it's just angle kappa, and so 0.4 or more of angle kappa is gonna be potentially an issue, and the patient is very motivated, I will counsel the patient. We don't know if this is a huge factor. I will do the surgery on you, but there is some evidence that this could be an issue, and we have to be prepared to exchange. So that is, is as far as I take it. Coma, on the other hand, I shy away from trifocals in patients with coma because it's unpredictable. And in some of these hyperopes, uh, hyperopic LASIK, you have a moving target on this topography. You have no idea where they're looking through. It's kind of like a keratoconic. And so those patients, as Kathy um, mentioned earlier, you can just do a neutral spherical aberration and just do some mini monovision with them and they do fine. And, That's probably yeah, why I, I put I, that slide up. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Eric. I, I, think, I think you mentioned the post-LASIK guy, and I think th those uh, can be quite aberrated, especially if it's a decentered ablation. But we often find just non-treated um, you know, treated eyes, non-treated corneas that have some coma and have some an, an angle kappa. We've looked at this a lot, and I, I agree with Nicole. I've, I've done lit reviews, and I've looked at our results, looked at results across many centers. Um, didn't really find a lot of correlation with angle kappa. So I, I, I don't look at angle kappa actually anymore. Obviously, you have some extreme cases of patients with deviations and stuff, but but I, I found I find that it hasn't really related uh, to um, multifocal um, success and satisfaction. This has been our own experience, though. So I know others have had other debates on this. And for coma, I think we have to remember 
that um, this is so dependent on the aperture, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if someone has like a three millimeter, three and a half millimeter mesopic pupil, um, you probably don't have to worry about coma. You know, um, that's probably not going to be a real big issue. So I, I te I've tended to not be less to be, I've tended to be less worried about coma again in a non LASIK patient. Um, I think that you have to look though, is do they have some ocular surface issues? Do they have some corneal issues that we talked about earlier? But otherwise, um, I'm, I'm less uh, concerned. And I think if I am, I, I, I guess a question for you all, and Kathy, maybe I'll ask you this question. If you are concerned perhaps for coma angle kappa, would an EDOF lens be less uh, concerning? Would it be more tolerant of someone who has more coma? Yeah, so I think we don't know the answer to that, um, number one. Uh, but my thought is that it would be, and it all depends again on the motivation of the patient. And I agree. I only really worry about those things in patients who have some evidence of aberration anyway, or I'm worried about it. So it's an RK patient, it's a refractive patient, it's somebody who has other corneal issues. So, um, but I don't think we know the answer, but I would, again, just talk to the patient and say, we don't know the answer, but I think this is the best choice for you. There's a question that came up on pupil size by, by Jeb on one of our recent fellows. And, and I mentioned earlier, kind of, I look at that particularly if I'm looking at that with coma, but do any of you uh, look at pupil size for lens selection, particularly again, for a multifocal or an EDOF? Uh, does it, do you have cutoffs? Do you have any concerns or do you not look at it? I actually don't look at it because I haven't found that there's a patient I've ever seen that I thought in retrospect, I wish I had known they had a big or a small pupil ahead of time because I would or would not have put this technology in them. Yeah, I, I mean, I still look at it um, just for counseling purposes. I wouldn't rule someone out, um, but I, I definitely think all these things have potential. And, you know, if you are the one that brings it up beforehand, then it's their problem, right? So Sam Maskett, my mentor, always taught me this. But if you don't bring it up and it happens after, then it's your problem. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of you know, have mixed feelings about it. I mean, you know, on one hand, a small pupil, the patients already have a good depth of focus and they're probably going to have some increased range of vision. So you wonder how much value they'd have in one of these lenses, although I don't think it's a negative per se. Um, a patient with a large pupil, now most multifocals and EDOF lenses are, are not uh, pupil dependent, um, although contrast can, can change, as we said earlier with that, but as far as function and light transmission. So modern day lenses tend to, tend to have less pupil effect on their performance, at least in terms of photopic conditions. Um, so uh, I think that's less of a concern. Um, some of the other EDOP lenses that are out there around the world do have some more pupil dependence in terms of their impact as well. So it's something to consider. And particularly with a large pupil, you'd have to worry a little bit about, I think at least, some increased risk for dysotopsy, even for a monofocal lens. Uh, we have lenses out there that you know many people don't understand, but we have six millimeter optical, optic lenses, right? The six millimeters you know, in diameter in, in, in their size but the actual effective optic is less than six. It's like 4.7, 4.5, depending on the IOL power. And that creates a little facet around the edge of the lens. And in some patients that can create starburst and halos. Um, and so even that kind of patient with large people, I would be concerned in that. There are some full optic lenses out there. Um, the lenses that have a higher incidence of refraction um, tend to be able to fit through small incisions and therefore can have a full optic like the Acrosoft material while others have a lower incidence refraction, perhaps less internal reflection, but they have a smaller effective zone. Uh, Nicole mentioned the silicone LI61U, which uh, has a benefit from that perspective of having a larger optic and still fits to a small pupil, but a lot of people aren't, aren't using silicone, although that is potentially a benefit for that lens. So just something to consider in all of this, not to get too complicated, that a lot of things to consider when it comes to pupil size, not only for multifocal lenses, um, but I do warn people with larger pupils, they may have some more concern as far as dysphotopsy in general. I think it's interesting that we may have all of these different companies coming out with pupil constricting solutions for presbyopia, and that maybe in some of these patients who have, you know, dysphotopsia is associated with pupil size after a premium lens um, uh, solution, maybe those will be helpful. So, uh, and a really robust discussion on the chat group. I'm glad that folks are generally agreeing uh, in many ways. So, um, that's great to see. Um, it is coming on 12 o'clock and I do want to be sensitive to both Kathy, Nicole and, and Sharif. Uh, Amadeep and I are, are here, you know, uh, for longer. So um, if you, when, it, when, when you guys need to hop off, just let me know. And I, I want to give you the chance to make any remarks. So how are you guys for time? Please don't feel you have to stay. I mean, Canadians, we're in lock, we're locked down here, guys. We're like, we're stay at home. So we're going for six hours today. 
Wow. Six hours. Well, I don't know if I can go six hours, <laughs> but uh, but I'll tell you that was the fastest two hours I've ever seen. I was like, really? It's twelve o'clock. I can't believe it. So it I'm, has I'm gone by fast. Now. Yeah. No, we, I mean, and yeah. So both of you, please. Uh, I want I want to thank both of you. You're welcome to stay again. We have more cases, and we'll, and we'll go through the, the, the discussion. So. Um, uh, I don't want to keep it for too long. So I, what kind of lenses are you going to have uh, when it's time for your cataract surgery? <laughs> okay, let's ask, that, let's ask that. Let's ask that question because <laughs> we have a few people asking that question. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to take the director's uh, prerogative and answer that question after everyone else does. Oh. Even my chair. <laughs> oh, <not laughs> let's go around the table. Let's let's go. I was going to go based on age, but we shouldn't do that. Let's go. Let's go. Um, who wants to answer that one first? I should say. Let's pick on Amity first. We'll let you go first because you're the junior guy. See, this is this is tough for me because I'm emotropic and pre presbyopic, so I have no idea what it feels like to need glasses for anything. <laughs> um, and I definitely, I mean, I definitely would want some sort of presbyopic um, solution. Many of us have type A personalities. I certainly do, um, and I don't know how well I would do with um, dysphotopsia. So, so far, I, I gotta say, I've been impressed with the, the EDOFs in terms of uh, the, the compromise. So luckily for me though, I have a few years and I, I, I'm pretty sure that there'll be new options available by then, but I've been impressed. Well, we're assuming you have a cataract now, like you got, you know, your, yeah. your, your, your little, your little baby kicked there. you in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you're going yeah. EDOF. I, I, I'm probably going, I'm probably going EDOF. Um, <laughs> Keith Leanne saying he is not answering the question. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard. I don't, I, 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 that's why. That's why. That's know. why your chair answered asked the question. He asked hard questions. <laughs> well, and I defer to you because he's monovision naturally. Oh, Sharif's monovision. Okay, that that was it. That was that was it. So 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 I'm gonna. You got cum fingers cataract. You need to have surgery now. What are you, what, what what are you telling me to put in or putting Sharif, asking Kathy Nicole or Sharif whoever's operating on you? Yeah, I mean, so, so I mean, hopefully not count finger because my biometry is going to be terrible then, um, right? But it, it, as long as you got good biometry, I'm probably going eat off personally. Okay. Um, what about what about you, Nicole? You know, I want to see more from the eye hands, um, but I'm definitely uh, someone who is, you know, very OCD in the office and in the OR. But in the rest of my life, I'm pretty chill with not a lot of drama. Um, so I would definitely either choose an eat off or the eye hands monofocal plus that's offset. Okay. What about Kathy here now? All right. So I'm a, a pretty high myope actually, and I am definitely in presbyopic age. And so I do all kinds of different things with my multifocal bifocal contact lenses, mini monovision, monovision, all kinds of different things. I think I'm training neuroplasticity into myself. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, so the question is, am I still operating or not? I think that's important, you know? So if I'm still operating, really contrast sensitivity and all of those things matter more. Um, I think in my personal life, I'm pretty low key. But if I had to choose today, I think what I would do, <laughs> somebody's telling me that I should do p and Keith is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I, I think I would wait a little bit for uh, Vividi on Clarion with Mini Mono. That's what I do. So, uh, uh, so a newer material, I think that that's pretty good. Um, Sharif, what about you? And I, I will answer the question too, for sure. Well, I'm going, I'm going for it. aspheric monofocals. Um, and, I, I, did, and are you monovision? And I would say, you know, I love monovision. I'm minus a half and minus two. And it works just great. And so I think I think it's a great option. I, I don't think we should ever forget monovision. It's always a good option. And I don't think we should discount our aspheric monofocals. They're great lenses. And that's where I'm going. Yeah, for me, I, I am I am like uh, so I, I don't wear glasses. I don't wear reading glasses or glasses for distance. I've been fortunate all my yeah. life so far. Um, I I'm about like about a minus 0.25 plus 0.5 or so. I got a little bit of cylinder. Um, a little bit of um, more myopia on my, on my, my non-dominant eye. I am very strongly dominant, for sure strongly dominant. I know that for sure. So um, I want to have, you know, a very good, strong, you know, um, monofocal lens in my right eye. Um, in my left eye, 
uh, I'm happy to be a little bit off, like about minus 0.5. And I would consider to have an eat off in my left eye, for example. And I, I think, for example, using the same platform would be important. Um, so whether, for example, it's a Clarion IQ in my right eye and a Clarion Vivid in my left eye, doesn't exist yet, but that would be one. I like the material better for sure. Um, I'm, I'm not a yellow fan, I'll be honest with you. I, I, don't mean, I don't mean to be disparaging, but I would prefer a clear platform, which I'm glad that these lenses are gonna be available in a clear platform. Why not have the clear lens and have the best possible uh, vision as, as you are as a baby? Um, and uh, I would though consider the uh, eye hands. Um, again, a technus in the right eye uh, for, for, for distance and then an eye hands in the left eye uh, aiming for about minus a half. That's kind of what I would do at this point in time. I, I don't think I would do well with a multifocal lens um, at this point. So Keith, is that a good answer? I mean, I wouldn't be a good politician. Um, <laughs> so that's great. I mean, and again, there's no perfect option as you, as you heard earlier. Um, okay, I do want to, again, we, we'll continue to go through. I do want to, um, again, give Kathy and Nicole, uh, are you guys staying or no? I don't want to put you on the spot either. I just want to, I, the reason I'm asking, I want to give you thanks if you're leaving. I want to give you, maybe I'll do it now anyways, because you guys can drop off whenever, but but you both have been amazing uh, to be with here today. Um, and again, you, you're really hearing people who know the technology really well, but I think you're seeing the honesty and the credibility, which uh, is hard to do. And it's hard to balance it out when you have all these competing interests and things. Um, we all intend to be, but I think what you're hearing uh, is really, I think, uh, telling it as it is, which is, which is amazing. And um, I, I love the spirit and the vibe in this discussion. We had a really good, have a really good discussion and the, the chat group has been really busy. Um, so I want to thank you both uh, for being part of this uh, discuss discussion, um, getting up on a Saturday morning. Uh, Amadeep and I will continue along. Are you good to continue, Amadeep, still? Sure. Heard the, I heard the little guy in the background earlier. I, I'm sure he'll make an appearance. <laughs> And okay, I, so I'm I just wanted to say thank oh, you sorry, to, Steve, to yes. everybody. I'm going to get going, but this was a fantastic two hours. I've taken home so many pearls. Uh, Kathy, Nicole, you were just fabulous. Thank you for, for all your comments and, and pearls. Ike and Amandeep, you've done a wonderful job. Such an enjoyable session. Uh, thank you all. Thank Thanks you for being here, Sharif. For no, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Amandeep, are we going to go to, um, should we go to the, um, the next uh, case? Sure. Well, actually, let's let's finish off with that one. There was just a question about how to pick your post okay. basic IOL. Okay. Okay. Sure. And there was actually a great question in the chat group earlier about Pentacam, and this is a great um, example of that. So, um, so this is the right eye, so the centered ablation, and we've got the um, Barrett True K on the right, and then we've got the multiple formulas from the uh, ASCRS website, and. Uh, I'd love to hear from the panelists. So here we've got an IQ monofocal lens teed up. Um, which power are you picking here? I mean, personally, I, I look at all the different formulas, but Barrett True K usually wins for me. And, um, and that's usually what I'll, what I'll end up going with. And there's good um, agreement at a 23 diopter lens that way. Yeah, so I'm, you know, looking at Aura, I'm looking at the Barrett True K and now the Barrett True K TK. Um, we're about to do a study looking at um, HIGAS, just the regular HIGAS with um, the TKs from IL Master 700. That's also looking good. So which which power are you picking here, Nicole? 23. Put you on the spot. <laughs> 23, uh, okay. At 20, well, it depends on the Aura. So I'll go, uh, the Aura will be the deal breaker for me. So 23.5 uh, if that's what Aura wants, or 23. And Ike? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I love the Barrett True K, uh, TK. Um, total keratometry, remember this, it's confusing, right? TK, TK, yeah. True K mm -hmm. with, with the total keratometry. And, and I used to do the whole ASCRS calculator thing we, we have here. Now I just use my 700, and I just basically get the printout with the TK, uh, True K on it. And I use that. I've been very happy with that at this point in time. There's a lot of new things happening though. Um, you know, Kane, as we just saw from Daryl and the new Hoffer QST, all these different types of lenses that uh, formulas that are out there, we'll have to see where they end up. But I've been happy with that approach and it's simple and it's on the, on the LO Masters. That's what I've been doing. I'll make one comment here about the Pentacam formula. Dr. Mather was asking that from London, Ontario. I guess my comment there is I have personally found that the Pentacam is consistently, the Putman Hill formula is a consistent outlier on the ASCRS website. So I've, I've sort of just abandoned um, inc inc including that one. 
Yeah, I mean, we do Pentacam. I, I have to admit, I don't look at it very often for this purpose. Um, I agree with that. I haven't found it to be as reliable uh, in my experience as well. Okay, we'll, we'll try to move through these cases quickly uh, while, while we still have Nicole and Kathy here. Amazing. Um, but with, by the way, I mean, I hope you get a chance to see, if you haven't met Kathy and Nicole and Amadeep as well in person, I mean, just the warmest of times. I mean, I remember it was a year ago, we were at... Uh, Cataract surgery, telling like it is down in Florida. Um, and, uh, you know, who knew, who knew that would be one of our last meetings in person, uh, for me at least. And, uh, you know, I don't remember what the meeting was, but I remember the time we had after hours together in the lounge or at dinner. Um, and just just the warmth that you all have is, is amazing. So and I, I feel miss it through guys, the screen a little bit. Miss you guys, for sure. Yeah, I do miss you guys a lot. Um, okay, uh, Amadi, you want to take this one? Sure, so this is the husband of the previous patient. He too had LASIK around the same time as her. Records not available. Her surgery went very well. So now he's interested in his options. And unlike her, he's much more reluctant to accept readers. He doesn't use them much now. And that's uh, consistent with his, his preoperative refraction here. And so what would you guys suggest for uh, Mr. Mike here? And we can go to the next slide and demonstrate his uh, biometry and topography. So he looks like he's got more regular uh, corneas centered here not as steep not not as flat i should say yeah yeah i mean i think this guy is a great uh, um choice for correcting his dominant eye for distance and letting him get a little bit of monovision experience and deciding what to do with the second eye and i would give him options i'd say look we're going to see how that works for you we might decide to give you monovision we might decide to do something different like an edof uh, result just depending on how your experience is with your your uh, dominant eye. Yeah, I fully agree. Uh, I don't have experience with the synergy yet and to see how, you know, forgiving it is in terms of dysphotopsis, but this is the example that we were talking about earlier, where if the cornea looks like a relatively normal cornea, you can consider more technologies, but the safest bet uh, is what Kathy discussed. Okay. Um, and I, I do have a follow-up question for you guys. So I, I agree. I mean, this cornea was more regular than his wife's cornea. Um, and I did feel comfortable offering him a vividity. But now the next question is um, in terms of targets. So, so this is my Barrett um, PK. So just a question, Amadeep. I mean, would, would you, is a, is, a, is, a mono, is a multifocal completely out of the question in this patient? Completely out of the question? No, it's not. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I'm happy with his, his cornea here. Uh, as you said, there's a regular astigmatism. I think it's a little, um, little easier the chair, the chair time in the conversation um, to go with an EDOF, especially given the myopia that he currently has. So that sort of tilted my decision making as well. He's about a minus one right now, um, and I can certainly replicate that. And he's not using the readers much with that, so um, I, I can certainly replicate that um, with an EDOF. How old is he though? Because that's one thing you need to keep, keep in mind because he may have some, you know, accommodative ability on top of his minus one right now. He's in his mid sixties. I know the picture may not look like it, but he's in, <laughs> his, I, I, his wife is 65. So let's say he's 65 too. Yeah. yeah I mean, great, that's a great question. That's a great comment. It's just one of those things that I've run into before where, you know, they get some range of vision if they still have some accommodative ability that they won't get with a monovision, monofocal lens, or, you know, and, and so just, I'd like to know that before I'm really thinking about it, but with a Vividi lens, obviously they'll get some range. Yeah, I, I, I think this is a candidate for a multifocal lens. And, this, and I think you're right, there's less chair time in the sense of just the concerns around dysphotopsia with the Edoff lens, but the near performance is unparalleled with a multifocal. And I don't do a ton of multifocals, I will say that, but I at least always put out there front line and a very motivated patient, um, I, I think I think this one would be a candidate. However, as we heard earlier, there's gonna be a chance we're gonna be off refractively as far as targeting. And we need to be on target for our multifocal patients. So I'd wanna make sure the patient could still be a candidate for post IOL uh, laser vision correction if necessary, um, which may be needed here. Um, That's a great comment. So, we always look at the, we always look uh, as well as the um, pachymetry and make sure that, you know, we know what the plan would be if we have to do a touch up. Like that last patient who had a 35 um, diopter cornea, 
you know, that, that one, you know, as much as, and I would think about, I'm, we've done TCAT, for example, topographic guided, um, you know, laser vision correction for patients who have really funky corneas, right, that are aberrated and then uh, have, you know, a better cornea to treat with an IOL. But that patient may not be the best candidate considering their cornea. We have to determine more details and, and look at their tomography as well. Uh, but that's an, I think it's one thing that's important to kind of consider when we're doing these lenses for these patients. So I think I'll consider it, but go ahead, um, Amadeep. Okay, so absolutely. I mean, I think that's really important in terms of planning after the eye wall surgery. Now I will ask the panelists to put pen to paper here and say which spherical equivalent and which torque power um, would you pick for this patient here? And if we're, this is assuming we're going with the Vividi lens here. So Vividi and right eye dominant, you said? Right eye dominant. Okay. Who wants to take a first stab? I want my readers. I can't see it. <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm I put you as big as I could put you here, but I can't make it bigger. It is small. Oh, you you, you I, need to, you need to think, have a synergy lens. I think it's a 19 and the T4 that's recommended closest to Plano in the right Correct. eye. Is that Correct. right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I, I like that for the right eye. 19 T4. And for the left? And for the so, left? So the, the left will give you a 19, will give you a minus 0 0.08 spherical, and the 19.5 will give you a minus 0.43. So I go with a 19.5 in the left. Um, All right, Annette. Go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead, Nicole. You. <laughs> you know, this is a scenario where I, I definitely also want to look at what they're wearing in their glasses, right? So, so Ike mentioned this earlier and to see if everything lines up. So when you're considering any sort of um, toric correction, especially when it's post LASIK, when you don't know what the posterior corneal contribution is really doing in that case, I want to look at what they're wearing in their glasses. I look at the auto refraction, I look at the topography and I look at, I do a, a lens star and an IOL master. So I want to have at least three of them saying the same thing. But you know, I know people are down on intraoperative amerometry, like it's not as interesting as it was, but if you have really good measurements and you know when to not listen to it, it can really help you uh, determine the power uh, of correction because if you overcorrect in these patients, you're gonna flip the axis against the rule and that can cause problems. And even though we talk about, you know, Vividi is performing really well. I wish it was a different material, um, but, you know, if you don't hit your targets, this patient's going to be unhappy. And so using as, as much technology as within bounds is important. And I would use intraoperative aberometry to help me. I'm always aiming minus a quarter with the Vividi. So I'm never aiming just on Plano. Um, and, and the reason for that is, as I mentioned, if I'm going to do any sort of enhancement later, it's easier for me to go in that direction. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, I, I would agree. And that's kind of what I did here. I, if we go to the next slide. Um, so I did hedge my bets a little bit. Um, and I picked the 19.5 and undercorrected the sill just a little bit right. because of uh, the, the points that Nicole already raised. So um, we, let's, any other comments from the, the panel? Looks like he did a great thing and he has a wonderful result. The other thing I always check though, is their binocular visual acuity. I think you know, you really do get some align often better, especially at near with um, binocular summation. Although, I mean, this patient's already seen 2020 in the left eye. Look at that great result in the left eye. Distance still 2020 with a minus, I guess, minus 50 and 2020 near 2020 intermediate. That's great. That's, 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 that, those are all, um, these patients are always like, always like that. <laughs> that's not true. All my <laughs> patients are going to you now. <laughs> no, the, no, um, that, that's yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I would have really stood by the 19 on the right eye. I, I, I do find that I want to hit that Plano target for their distance eye. Um, I mean, of course you can't argue with the results. I also would encourage people to look at your lens constants. I have personally found with the Vividi that a lens factor of 1.99 is a little high. I've dropped mine down to 1.93 because we were getting a little bit of myopic outcomes with that lens factor. And again, it's gonna, it's gonna depend on your own uh, you know, results. So whatever lens you use, especially new lenses out there, I recommend know the manufacturer's constant, go online and look and see what uh, you know, some of the population data is on lens factors and A constants, and then look at your own and optimize it after you do uh, a bunch of patients, preferably in that average range of axial length, not the extremes, of course. So between 22 to 24 and a half and average Ks uh, and do that. I think it's important to do that for that, for that purpose. 
I, I, someone asked a question about the Technus lenses. One of the benefits I will mention for Technus is that the eight constants in my, in my hands are all the same. All the same. I know, it's great. I love that, I love that actually. Whether it's a monofocal Technus, eye hands, symphony, or, or synergy, or even you know the, the, the multifocals, um, all the same. Right, that's actually the next great. case. If you want to is keep it? them moving. What, yeah. One second, I just wanted to say for Vividi, it is really important to push plus um, when you're refracting them because they can look more minus than they actually are. So just make sure when you're doing good that point. refraction, you're really pushing plus. Really good point. Really good point. Okay, Amadeep, we're going to go fast a little bit. Yeah, so this is a great example of the Technus um, A constant being very very easy to, to, to use. Uh, so this is a patient who, again, another real case that I had recently, 77-year-old woman who had cataract surgery in her left eye three years ago. Uh, and she's very, very happy with her symphony lens um, in that left eye. And you can see the sticker. Um, so she, I, always try to, I always try to figure out what the previous lens is uh, exactly. So um, we've got the sticker there from the original surgery. Her one comment is that if possible um, with her right eye surgery, she, she is interested in a little bit more near. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna launch a poll here for the audience. And what, what would you suggest here while the panelists sort of um, share their thoughts? I mean, totally just for people, that, for people who aren't familiar with, could you just tell what, what, what lens that is? Oh, I'm sorry. So that's the, that's the Technus Symphony lens. Which is in, an EDOF lens. lens. Which is an EDOF lens. So the Symphony EDOF in the left eye. And she's, she's very happy with it. Now we do have the option of putting in a panoptics or a synergy as well in the right eye. Um, and so I'll ask, and, if, and we can also do an EDOF for a bit, a bit of near. So what would the panelists do here? And so she, she has a completely healthy eye otherwise. Yes. Yeah. And her dominance? Right eye. Mm. All right, what do people think? Yeah, so I mean, I think that, you know, you have a lot of options actually here in order to improve her near vision, but completely healthy eye, I'm comfortable putting in at least the same tint, you know, if it's clear, put a clear lens in. Um, I don't have synergy, so I can't really speak to that. Although I'm impressed with what you showed before Ike with the near point and things. So that might be an option if we had it. Um, otherwise I would be okay even maybe with a clear panoptics in the other eye. You know, it's mixing and matching. I'm not so adverse to mixing and matching though as my good friend, Nicole um, or Ike. Uh, but so it's just about education at that point. You know, letting I'm with you, Kathy. Oh, yay. <laughs> well, I, I would just qualify by that by saying mixing and matching could, could be putting a, a panoptics yellow in the eye versus a synergy. Like, I, I think there's a bit of a, might be some differences in there. Like, I mean, I would be, I would be open to, to a technus platform here in this case, but I'd be a little reluctant using a yellow platform, for example, here, different material. Well, what about the champagne platform or the synergy? It's not a totally clear lens good either. Good point. Good point. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's less of a concern. Although you're right, the synergy does have the violet uh, filtering, as and the base technus and the symphony don't. So, but I think that's less impactful. So I, I would make an exception here and consider, consider um, using a synergy in the right eye in this case. I I wouldn't want. Although the majority have voted for eat off minus a half, and I, again, because the right eye is dominant, I wouldn't do that. I would come out strong and say I wouldn't do that personally. This is my own personal expression personal um, opinion? Um, I, you know, I think the key is that it's that she's saying a little bit more near, right? So she's not asking for it all. Um, and, you know, prior to this, we were doing symphony and a little bit of offset with a minus 50. And I don't think minus 50 is going to take it over the edge for um, dominant. So I would go eat off minus 50 in the right eye. I like the technologies to be as similar as possible. Now, if the eat off, I mean, and trifocal or diffractive technology of the synergy uh, is similar enough, then that could be a good option also. Okay, so I, maybe we can go to the next slide. And before I tell you what I did with her, I would also ask for for lens selection. So the good thing, again, with the, the Technus platform, so it says Symphony there, but you can pick whatever you want. Synergy has the same A constant. If we were, if we were gonna go for a minus a half um, with a Symphony, what are you picking here, Nicole? Are you going with the 16 or the 16 and a half? You can't, you, there's no minus That's half here. Yeah, that was good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it all depends on how happy she is with the distance in the other eye, right? So right now you're mimicking this situation in some way. She's a minus a three quarters in the right eye and she's, you know, she has some sill in the left eye, but there is that landing platform of the symphony also where it's a little bit uh, more forgiving. So if she is a really good, you know, 2025 or better uncorrected, um, then I would go 16.5 um, in, in the eye. Um, if she does, she's like, my distance is good, you know, it kind of says it like that, then I would go more for the minus 0 0.36 and do a 16. Do you see that patients sometimes have more visual disturbances with the symphony, the more myopia, you, more myopic you leave them? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I'd be yeah. a little concerned about that. So I might That's leave them. Great. Good point, great good point. I, I agree with you, Kathy, on that one, it's true. Um, and I wanna make one point is that's why I flip back here. You wanna look at how they did in the first eye. So an 18.5 diopter was put in the first eye and the patient ended up with a spherical equivalent of near plano, pretty well near plano, maybe slightly on the hyperopic side. So it's just good to go look at the printout and just see what would an 18 million five have predicted. And if it was similar to what it was, you could be confident that the right eye calculation will be similar. I'm sure many of you do this for second eye calculations. You look at how the first eye did and compare it and then go to the second eye. So um, that's, one, that's one point here if you're, gonna, if you're gonna compare them. And here I think, you know, if you're putting a symphony, if you're putting um, a synergy in, what did you pick, Amadeep? Are you gonna pick a 15 or 15 and a half? Yeah, so I, I actually, you can show the results. I actually did pick the synergy for this patient. Um, and we went 15 and a half for, for, for Plano refraction. And uh, if you hit the next slide, she's pretty happy afterwards. All your patients are happy. Again. <laughs> well, it, it, there's a selection bias, sure. <laughs> the, the, and of course, the other nice thing here was the, the, uh, the biometry. So the astigmatism uh, allowed me to, to, to pick a non-toric lens here. Right. right. Yeah, Synergy is not available toric yet. It will be available in Canada toric, but not yet. And and I wonder why point. that is, since they launched Symphony, Symphony Toric at the same time. It seems strange to me that they didn't launch So, Symphony. So in Canada, same thing. We had the Symphony non-Toric first, and then we had a period of time, and then we had Symphony Toric. Mm. Uh, it's just our regulatory you know, body, I guess, that needs a bit more evidence from, from a Toric side of things. So, And we're also excited, by the way, just I should have mentioned as well, that uh, the uh, Technus Toric 2. Do you have the Technus Toric 2 available in the U.S.? Yes. Okay. So I think that'll, that'll be, that's, we're looking forward to that just in terms of better rotational stability, um, you know, compared to the original platform. We'll see, we're looking forward to that. Maria Delgado from, from um, Colombia is, is here from Bogota. And she asked a question about, Vividi ended up being minus one myopic. You didn't plan on that, but you meant it minus one. Uh, what do you do to correct it and when? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, we, number one, I, I like to give patients a bit of time. So the first thing you want to do, in my opinion, with this patient is push the plus and make sure they're actually minus one. So that's a that's an easy, especially early user of Vividi mistake is looking like you're more myopic than you actually are in your result. And then these patients, I do wait a bit. I don't think there's a big difference in my hands, um, even with an exchange, if you were going to do that in waiting you know, three months or even six months with something. The flip side is you don't want the patient to be really unhappy for a long period of time. So for me, it's more like the patient psychological um, factors that time when we're going to do something. So, and then I always put a patient in contact lens and say, look, this is what you're going to get if we do what we're planning on doing. And so maybe they don't want a whole minus one correction. Maybe they want a little bit less. So they still have some enhanced near there. So um, I think all of the planning portion and the whole hand holding portion is the most important part of this. Yeah, I fully agree. I think also waiting until they're off of their drops. Uh, so a lot of times the drops that we give um, can cause a lot of ocular surface issues or, you know, foreign body sensations. So waiting until they're off of their drops is huge. And then doing a contact lens trial, just like Kathy said, to see how much they want to be corrected is critical. And then your skill set, you know, do you use a laser as your eraser or IOL exchange? So it just depends, you know, usually if we're hyperopic, we're more likely to do an exchange. And if we're myopic, we're more likely to do a uh, laser vision correction. And Nicole, on that question, does it matter to you which IOL it was? I mean, if you have a surprise with, let's say a monofocal lens versus a trifocal lens, does that shift your decision-making at all? It, it doesn't. I mean, you know, I think that 
you know, if you're using an Alcon platform, you know, the Technus, uh, I'm sorry, the um, Panoptics or the Vivity, you really need to be on target. That's just what I've noticed. And on the other platforms, um, it's, it's not as much of an issue. But I think, you know, one of the biggest reasons why people come to me unhappy after uh, a diffractive IOL technology is because they miss their targets. And so often just a, even a wavefront guided um, uh, laser vision correction just solves the problem. The only other thing that I think about too, though, is if they were, uh, you know, a higher amount of astigmatism and they were a toric lens and it's just nailed it. I mean, one of the nice things is you take it out, there's usually sort of a memory of where the lens was sitting. And so the next lens might sit in the same place. But I kind of think, oh, we nailed that. I don't necessarily want to take that lens out too. So that also sways me more toward, uh, you know, a laser vision correction. Sometimes these are post uh, LASIK patients, they have thinner corneas. And so that comes into the calculation as well. Great points. Thanks for answering that, everybody. Um, okay, so maybe we'll do, what do you think? I'm gonna do one more, one more case. Yeah, let's do one more case. Here. Um, Mr. Mr. TK is a nice one. Mr. TK, okay. Um, Mr. TK. Let's do Mr. TK, okay. <laughs> Good choice, okay, all right, here we go. <laughs> Who's this guy? All right, so you got this guy, run-of-the-mill patient here. And um, he, there's his preoperative refraction. So he's got myopic astigmatism, high myopic astigmatism in both eyes. He currently wears full-time bifocals um, he, all day. So he does not really benefit from his near vision. And um, he's really slowing down from whatever he used to do. And all he wants to do is play golf. And he's looking for the best distance correction um, and is interested in torque lenses. So let's go to the next slide, Ike. Um, and here's his biometry. So he's got just over three diopters of astigmatism in, in the cornea against the rule and uh, the topography matches there. And we can go to the next slide. And so here's the dilemma. Uh, this is a situation where um, the, the online printout, the, using the predicted uh, posterior corneal astigmatism is demonstrated on the left there. It's calling for a T8 uh, toric, while the TK printout from the Iowa Master 700 shown on the right is calling for a T6. And so uh, I am going to launch one last poll here for the audience as to what lens are you gonna go, specifically which toric correction are you gonna go with here? So just to be clear again, as Amadeep mentioned, on the left side is the predicted um, total K that the Barrett formula is predicting based on the anterior cornea only, based on the Barrett nomogram. And on the right, you're seeing a direct measurement of the total cornea, looking at the anterior and posterior curvature of the cornea using the Alamaster swap source OCT. Uh, to measure that and using using that measurement. It's interesting because usually with against the rule, like this is 3.24 diopters against the rule on the anterior cornea, you would expect to see a lot more on, on the total, right? Because the posterior cornea would yeah. typically gives you more. The more anterior with the rule you have, the more effective, you know, posterior cornea with the rule you, against the rule you have. So it's it's interesting, but but again, this is this is against the rule, I should say. So with the rule would be a bit more, uh, a bit more concerning, I guess. Okay, so let's see how that poll is going. So you're getting all kinds of results here. Do you see the poll? I've lost it somehow. I don't. Yeah, I don't see the results anyway. Let's see if you can. I, do you guys you see go. the results now? I do yes, now. I do. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So the majority of the audience did go for the T6, although there's some votes for T7, splitting the difference, and a few people are going with the T8. Um, panelists, any thoughts? I mean, I certainly don't mind flipping the, the I, in these cases, flipping to with the rule from against the rule. You know, I wouldn't want to do it the opposite way, but this way, you know, I think there's a little more wiggle room if you get it wrong, uh, rather than leaving them with some residual with the rule astigmatism. Um, I don't have enough experience with the TK formulas to feel super confident. So when I'm not super confident yet, I, uh, I might hedge a little. So I'd probably be the T7 person. You know, th this is where I wish, and I don't, I don't know what the cold thing is. I wish that the, the I must have printout would show you like what the residual cylinder would be 
for a T6, T7, and T8, like the like the printout does online. Right. So you I know, can that's a great point for the audience here. The if you look at the right side here, the resi the residual sill expected is 0.45 with mm -hmm. the T6. So in fact. The problem is with the IO Master, it doesn't flip the axis, and the T7 will probably have the least residual sill based on the TK, uh, is what Ike is getting at. Right. Um, what was he wearing in his glasses? Um, in his glasses, he in the left. That's the left eye minus three fifty plus four at seven degrees. Right. So you know. I, I do use intraoperative aberrometry in these cases. I do think that that will help if it's consistent. If it's off the mark, it doesn't help at all. Um, but I would hedge on a, a T7. I like okay. that. I like that. That's that's exactly what I, I was going to say. That I'm sure if you if you got the printout on TK T7, because look, there's still a 0.45 diopters of cylinder still, right. which is a lot actually, right? And I'm pretty sure a T7 is going to drop it down to near like 0.1 or something. Right, so, and the, other, the, the biggest trouble that I get into is under correcting against the rule. Mm -hmm. You know, I, and, and it's, it's easily fixed. You do an LRI in the office, you know, it's fine. But it's, it's frustrating because those are the patients that you were expecting, you know, more from. Oh my gosh, Amadeep did not get 2020, guys. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> he just threw so, it in there. No, no, no. So, I'm just kidding. I mean, one interesting thought here, I think if you go to the next slide too, Ike, is, um, is we also have a pentacam on this patient. And I think for me, one, this was early on in, in experimenting with the TK formula, is I've been paying real attention to the, to the TK. And what I, what I found in this case in retrospect is that the, the TK isn't measuring that much more against the rule than the front surface was which perhaps indicates that the, the contribution of the back surface is, is not as much as, we, as maybe the nomogram expects. And that's perhaps why the, the, the predicted formula is over correcting the, the astigmatism and the pentacam demonstrates that there is negligible effect on the posterior cornea. And so uh, the T8 probably would overcorrect this patient um, while a T6 or T7 uh, is probably the wiser choice. So I, I would urge people to look at that, look at the Ks, look at the TKs, and just make sure that it makes sense with what we know from um, how the posterior cornea behaves. And Richard made a great point. So this patient was very happy, right? Uh, despite the re residual refraction, this patient is very happy. There's nothing to do there because, I mean, when you go from a preoperative prescription like that to, to his post-op, he, 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 he may not be 20-20, like, but he's 20 happy. That's what counts. Yeah, that's all. Still win. Always winning. <laughs> Always winning. Yes, we got to be winning. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's great. Um, and I think as we've heard earlier, erring on the side of leaving somebody with a little bit of with the rule, you know, makes some sense. And, uh, and I think that's, that's, that's why the patient's probably happy as well. And for the long term will be as well. Um, well, that's been a marathon session, guys, and, and you, you both were real troopers. So, um, you know, thanks for staying longer. And, and I know the audience uh, really uh, has enjoyed this, and I thank them for all their comments. We have, you know, we had about 700 people plus online, and then we still have retained most of those here. So it's been really great. Um, I don't know. I'm, I, I always like to go around and just, you know, take the, take the pulse in the room and ask people, um, you know, any general thoughts, any advice to give to the group we have, I see medical students all the way to uh, folks that have been practicing for 50 years online here. Um, and uh, I think that if anything, COVID's taught me is to listen more um, and to hear, you know, the experiences of others and, uh, and that virtual hugs suck, but I do give you guys a virtual <laughs> hug and I will give them person soon, even Amadeep too, um, <laughs> even though he hates hugs. Amadeep hates hugs, by the way. So when you see oh, him, really? just give him the oh. biggest hug. Oh, yeah. And, and he'll be like, he'll be like, like this, right. But don't worry. So, so maybe let's start off with, 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 um, Nicole and any, any, uh, any just general, you can say whatever's, whatever's on your mind, it could be like, and you can pick on me or you can talk about you or talk about life or talk about eyes or torrents yeah, or whatever. You don't, open, you don't want to open that up with me, but, um, <laughs> no, I, I think that, you know, for the residents and, and, and even for the, um, you know, mids, and olders that it's really important to understand the technology before you put it in and to understand um, what are the steps that you take 
when you're adopting new technology. And I think looking back, listening to your patients, seeing your post-ops and spending time with them to go down this journey with you, you can really be an early adopter as long as you know how to take lenses out. Um, and so for me, that's given me the confidence to be an early adopter and experiment with technology. Uh, that's the most exciting part about ophthalmology is that every you know, two years we have something new. So really spending time and understanding IOL exchange and how to do it safely will allow you to really you know, move forward with your IOL selection. Very well said, beautiful. How about Kathy? Uh, I just wanna say it was so much fun being here with you and you're right, it's not the same as being in person but 2D is better than no D so I'll take it. <laughs> and uh, so, but the other thing is I'd say, I think the, the biggest um, way to feel comfortable moving forward and to really have a successful and pleasant experience with your patients is just educate them well. Make sure they understand like what you can do and what you can't do and what it can deliver and what it can't, what the limitations are uh, as well as what the advantages are. And being honest and realistic in that, don't promise the moon when you know that that's not possible. So as long as you do that and make the patient partner with you, you can't weed out everything that's gonna happen, but that will make the journey a lot more pleasant for you. So that would be my biggest thing. And then probably second to that, um, watch your outcomes refine your outcomes. If you're not looking at outcomes, you don't know what you're doing and it's going to be really hard to improve on what you're doing. So those are my two kind of pearls for the whole thing. And just so good to be here with you guys, virtual group hug here. <laughs> right back at you. By the way, there's some questions about your background, both of you actually. Ah, everybody. If you can, if you can explain your background, then I forgot to ask Nicole. Someone was asking where, what your view oh, is. I like, thought so. you meant my literal background. Yeah. Yeah. That background, <laughs> that background. Oh, Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, oh, I mean, your background's interesting too, as far as you. But I meant, I meant you're actually. I think they meant your painting behind you. Uh, Pretty cool. I've been noticing Kathy, that. Yeah, yours is a lot more interesting. Uh, yeah, just a good um, art festival shopper. That's all. You know, was a very cool guy who was really interesting and had all the elements. It has fish, waves, and an eye. So with my <laughs> marine biology background and eyes, it was made for me. <laughs> Nicole, where are you at? I mean, what you look like you're up I, in a. I'm in my office, so okay. yeah, that's my view. And what uh, is that? Are those the hills no, in the background? Have, these are orchids. That's Zach, my son, uh -huh. and my <laughs> husband you. Nate. Um, yeah, so I have no privacy at home, and I have screaming child in the background at spontaneous <laughs> moments. So I have to come to the office. Oh my gosh, we got you up so early, and you're at the office. You're such a trooper. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I love you. I'm just Thank you. steps from my bed, actually. That's, so. that's true love. That is true love. That that is right, right here, right here. Really, really, so kind of you, Nicole. Love you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Amini, what about your parting shots or words, whatever you want to call them? <laughs> I guess my parting thoughts would be it. one of the things that's really helped me early in practice getting good with um, presbyopic lenses is getting very comfortable with toric lenses. Um, I, I always tell my young colleagues this. Um, every, there's so much pressure to put in the EDOFs or the multifocal lenses. And that's what everyone talks about. But follow, like Kathy said, like refine, refine your results, get good with Torix. Um, because as people have alluded to all, all morning, that's really key to success with the presbyopic correction. Um, and th the other thing is find good mentors. And I um, have been extremely privileged and fortunate um, to have known Ike for 10 years now. Uh, I was thinking about this last night as we were putting, putting together this, this session. And it, it's like almost a third of my life. I'm a little, not exactly, I'm 35, but like for 10 years I've known Ike. That's a significant portion of my life. And the impact that he's had on me is incredible. So thank you. Um, and I would urge everyone to find themselves a mentor um, as good as the mentor that I have. Wow, that's, like, that's, that's more than a quarter of my life. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's 20% of yours, man. I know how old you are. Ike and I actually have the same birthday. So... I know how old he is. I've known him for about 20% of his life. So that's pretty cool too. That's amazing. Um, and by the way, uh, in that last picture, I'm, I'm gonna, you, were, you were closing your eyes. I have to take another one here, okay? So let's get, let's get another group okay. picture before we go, okay? So everyone nice and happy, smiling, open eyes. Thank you, great. 
So I, I again, I want to just uh, my my pearl will be just listen like we've heard earlier. I mean that connection with people is is what I think really is life is about in general, and the same in our office, right? I mean connecting with a patient doesn't mean spending twenty minutes with them; it means just connecting with them at the right level and the right conversation piece and and spending that time and attention. I think that's such an important piece, and that'll help us to know and guide us as far as what the right technology is. And I think that, you know, we should all really be comfortable and, and, and understand what the technology can do and what it can't do, and then connect that to that patient. And it's so rewarding when we do that. It also helps us when there's, a, when there's an outcome that we don't want to have or we don't desire to be able to manage that patient as well. I'm still, I'm really amazed at how we're pushing our limits with technologies. Um, and we've seen, I think the eat off market really grow. We've seen multifocal lenses uh, become more continuous and have a greater range of vision with less issues on contrast. Um, and we continue to be very comfortable with our delivery systems and continue to improve it as Amadeep has said. So great time to be in, in medicine, great time to be in ophthalmology. I hope everyone um, gets a chance to get vaccinated if you haven't already. And uh, we will continue to work hard and forward. I think this uh, has been an enlightening session. Um, really great. Thanks Amadeep for preparing so much on this one. Uh, he, ma he makes, you know, everything goes smooth and I just have to just press a button to go to the next slide. Um, and uh, both Kathy and Nicole, I love you both. You guys are amazing human beings, first and foremost. Uh, I've gotten to know both of you and, and that just makes your knowledge and your expertise um, that much more appreciated, right? I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful to see smart, intelligent, you know, go-getting people who want to help people who share their knowledge, right? You, you heard, you know, this is a Saturday morning for both these individuals in doing that. So uh, it means a lot to me personally, and it means so much to the people listening here and all our, all our friends and colleagues. And yes, at, at, the ne at the next few meetings that are in person, it's going to be incredible and amazing. So I look forward to seeing everybody. Thank you very much. Stay well. Peace and love to everybody. And uh, we'll see us here at the Cataract course next year in person um, and the next in-person meeting with all real in-person hugs. So yeah. all the best. Goodbye. Thank you. See you, guys. Bye, See you soon. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Have a good Saturday.